Good evening and welcome to tonight's recognition program. I'm Dennis Peterson, Superintendent of Schools. We begin each regular school board meeting recognizing the outstanding accomplishments of students, staff, and community members for their positive impact on our district. Tonight, we are recognizing some amazing achievements in academics, arts, and service. First, let's celebrate our AP scholars with honor from the classes of 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023. To earn this distinction, students earned an average score of at least 3.25 on all of the advanced placement exams they have taken, and they have achieved scores of three or higher on four or more exams. Our high school offers 28 AP courses for which students can earn college credit and weighted grades for academic honors. Nearly 81% of the class of 2020 took at least one AP or International Baccalaureate course as part of their four-year plan. Additionally, in 2020, 1,658 Minnetonka students took 2,875 AP exams. The number of exams and courses taken is only one example of how Minnetonka students challenge themselves and prepare for their pursuits after graduation. Our students are well prepared to take AP exams and their scores are exceptionally strong. On 84.7% of the tests taken in 2020, students earned scores of three or higher, which is considered the threshold to earn college credit. We will now hear from some of our AP scholars with honor who wanted to share how an AP course or class project impacted their educational journey and shaped their future plans. My name is Skull Raby and I am a junior. AP Chemistry was a course that significantly impacted what I want my career path to be in the future. I had already been set on taking a path that involved science, but the engagement my AP Chemistry teacher Dr. Say provided had me super interested in the area of chemistry as a whole. My experiences in the class had also led me to basing my research projects this year on biochem and biomedical engineering. Overall, without AP Chemistry, I don't think I would be in the same path I am now. Hi, uh, my name is Derek Kieser. I'm a senior in the class of 2021 this year. Uh, I've taken a number of AP classes throughout my high school career, and the one that I had the uh, most personal connection with was AP Biology. Uh, the class was really exciting because the curriculum was really interesting to me. We got to learn about uh, the human body, about microorganisms, and uh, a lot about how the natural world worked. And I was really inspired by this class so much so that I'm considering uh, biology for uh, my future plans for college. My name is Eric Quam. I am a junior. Uh, something about the AP program that has been really impactful for me is the amazing teachers that I've had. Um, my teachers have always been available for whenever we need help. Uh, they're extremely knowledgeable and passionate about their subjects, which in turn helps the students understand the material more and feel more excited about learning. Hi, my name is Greta Weeks and I'm a junior at Mentonka High School. I have taken four AP courses and I'm currently taking three more. I want to give a big thank you to all of my teachers who have taught me in these courses and have not only helped me to foster my love for the material, but have also helped by dedicating huge amounts of their time to my classmates and I to help us be successful. Their commitment and kindness is what's encouraged me to continue to push myself and take more challenging coursework in Mentonka. Thank you. I'm Sophie Hayden and my favorite AP class that I've taken is AP US History because I really enjoyed learning about history and I feel like the information that I learned throughout the class is very relevant to today and can be used to move forward in our lives. Our AP Scholars with Honor will each receive a medal to acknowledge their accomplishment that may be born at graduation. From the class of 2020, we recognize the following students as AP Scholars with Honor. Michael Allen. Matthew Oz, Jacob Bayer, Isabel Bong, Isabella Benton, Madison B.U.S., Brady Karen, John Zerwinski, Catherine Del Monte, Khan Dickel, Samantha Dragseth, Aiden Edge, Aiden Gonzalez, Dustin Green, Julian Heyman, Bryn Howe, Owen Johnson, 
Olivia Jones, Joram Keen, Margaret Latte, Sophia Lair, uh, Andrew Linden, Joy Loberg, Ryan Lund, Allison Lundborg, Isabel Madalena, Julia Mao, Christian McCullough, Addison Pejor, Andrew Sanders, Nathaniel Shimke, Ethan Silverman, Madeline Swanson, Juliana Torelli, Jobin Tonga, Carson Melchick, Jack Vukovic, Sean Walker, Russell Williams, and Giovanni Zulo. Congratulations to all of you on this achievement. From the class of 2021, we recognize the following students as AP Scholars with Honor. James Bank Ivers, La Lars Berhansel, Jillian Bluestein, Robert Borkert, Dominic Bradburn, Anna Brecker, Aaron Bros, Allison Carlson, Anna Sheeran, Gavin Clark, Jacob Durenberger, Aaron Fromelt, Abigail Gabler, Samuel Gallagher, William Gary, Sophia Hayden, Annalise Johnson, Derek Kieser, Chloe Langeren, Grace Lank, Grace Liu, Dalton Lorenz, Owen Murphy, Lori Ohm, William Poland Leclerc, Annika Powers, Isaac Reeder, Elian Retzlaff, Ella Roach, Monica Ruoff, Mia Sato, Andrew Seo, Jolie Shedd, Carolyn Simning, Marilyn Simonson, Carolee Sitt, Olivia Smith, Annika Tamti, Aidan Tidi, Emily Waddell, Lael Warren, Taylor Way, Matthew Wenning, Lisa Whipp, and Franklin Zhao. Congratulations to each of you on this achievement. For the class of 2022, we recognize the following students as AP Scholars with honor. Abra Arora, Kyle Sinji, Adeline Diaz, Jackson Jaffe, Vikranth Kurup, Cheyan Lee, Walker Liu, Joseph Matson, Reagan Miller, Delaney Nordis, Sophie Peterson, Eric Quam, Cole Raby, Henry Rosenhagen, Nigel Smithline, Declan St. John, Leah Tiff, Santa Walker, Jocelyn Wartnick, Greta Weeks, and Catherine Young. Congratulations to each of you on this achievement. Finally, from the class of 2023, we recognize the following students as AP Scholars with honor. Carter Fries, Jenny Kwan, Luke Rowan, Austin Wong, Luke Williams, and Jerry Zhang. Congratulations to each of you on this achievement. Next, we will recognize our student artists. Three times each year, our art teachers select a variety of pieces to display here at the District Service Center. This is one way to se we celebrate the outstanding work of our students and our commitment to the fine arts education. I want to thank each of our student artists and their teachers for loaning their work to us for public enjoyment. It's wonderful to see the variety of media students use to express their artistic talent. The selections this season are for Minnetonka High School students, and they are exceptional. Our high school art teachers who will be introducing the students we will recognize tonight are Steve Nugent, Meg Kanitzer, 
Lindsay Werner, Rebecca Marks, Anna Marie Umland, Paul Olson, Jonathan Mackey, and Sarah Young. Last month, these teachers and our MHS art students were able to connect during a special Google Meet to honor the students' accomplishments. Congratulations again to our teachers and artists. Thank you for sharing your talents with us. Well, artists, thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks for sharing your artwork to be displayed uh, with the Minnetonka School community. From photography and digital art to paintings, drawings, sculptures, you've used a wide variety of techniques and mediums to add beauty to our schools. And to be a part of the DSC Honored Art Showcase this season, your artwork was selected by the art department. Um, and we chose the best pieces from all of our classes at MHS. So being a part of this group is truly an honor and we applaud you for your effort. So we celebrate now by showing images of your artwork as we read your names. When we read your name, please give a wave and I will hand it off to Ms. Umland to get us started. Awesome. To those of my students, thanks for logging in today. Super fun to recognize you guys. Um, some crazy talented young artists in painting one. I am missing one student from my class as well, but I'll still read her name um, and we'll go from there. So first up, we I actually chose four students all from the same project. So it was our flower, water, bark, leaf kind of micro paintings. So first up was Adele Adams. If you could give a little wave, awesome. Second is Cece or Sierra Grad. Third is Dot, uh, Dasha Gitsovich. She's actually the one that is not here today, so we'll still recognize her. And last but not least, Caroline Rogan. On to a few of my students. Um, yeah, good job with all these things. You guys um, really um, stepped up to it, um, especially during uh, this COVID time. So way to go, folks. First in uh, my list, uh, we have Charlotte Carney, who made a really wonderful digital portrait here. We have AJ Altrichter, who is not here today, but he did a really cool job. Reminds me of some cool 80s work. Uh, we have Eli Hooker Reese, who made this wonderful um, digital photogram. We have uh, Emmy Brooks, who is not here today, but she made another cool digital photogram. For my students, I am so proud of you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I have two students that will not be here, but I'll still read their names to show their art. Uh, these are all actually from our portrait unit. So thank you so much for taking the time to create such wonderful artwork, despite all the curveballs thrown at us in this virtual world. So my first one is uh, Zach Undersayer. And then we have Luke Nelson. And Ellie Hayden. Ella Smith. And Leo Miller. Thanks, guys. All right. I am up next. I have a couple different classes here. Um, starting with Cedric Garcia. Sam Pullen. Can you give a wave, Sam? Thank you. Colin Timmers, Brady Schlepko, Atina Whitman. Moving on to drawing one, we have Tio Tedessa, Lucy Finch, Kayla Northway, Cynthia Zhang. Amit Ben Harush, Simon Weiss, Angelina Fisher. Welcome, everybody. And it's uh, great to see everybody's faces and great to see such awesome artwork. Uh, I'll start with my students. I have a, uh, one student from Drawing Three and some AP students. So I'll start off with Shannon O'Meara. Ellie Salmala. There she is. Hi, Ellie. Ben Reichert. 
Friends here. And Emma Van Zant. Next up, we have, uh, I'd like to recognize Lena Pack from IB Art. She actually has two pieces of artwork. And with IB Art, they like to explore uh, kind of themes within their work. So these are two are connected. My next student is Erin Bodger from Ceramics One, working on slump mold bowls. Evie Peters. Brianna Giebel. Charlie Palm. And then for my digital drawers, we have Parker Larson. Elena Muller. We have Sophia Sana. And Kennedy Crick. And that would be it. Great job, artists. We are so proud of you. Next, we will celebrate an award given out by the National Association of Music Merchants, or NAM, each year. NAM recognizes the best communities for music education. Good afternoon. Today, we celebrate that Manitoba Schools has, for the seventh consecutive year, earned the National Association of Music Merchants Best Communities for Music Award, Music Education Award. Uh, each of you, our music teachers, have played a key role in accomplishing that achievement. We make music educator, music education a priority. All students in our district are able to explore the gift of music and performance through band, orchestra, choral, and classroom music. They achieve great success with the support of their families, teachers, and community. Large in-person musical performances that each of you lead and coordinate, many of which are held uh, this time of year, are among the things we have missed the most this year. Each of you have been creative and resourceful during the challenging time that we've been in this fall. Uh, this past spring, you found new ways to engage your students virtually and during the hybrid learning model this fall. You work to make your music practices both safe and fun for students. <clears throat> Thank you for your dedication to your teaching and to our students. We're joined today by Doug Schmidt, Vice President of Schmidt Music. Uh, Schmidt Music has been an important fixture in the community for 124 years. Doug, were you here when it started? <laughs> a yeah, five gener a five-generation family business. It has grown to be one of the largest and most respected music retailers in the United States. We appreciate Smith Music's uh, partnership and efforts to recognize Minnetonka Public Schools for receiving the NAM Foundation Best Communities for Music Education Award. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Doug Smith. He will say a few words in recognition of this award, and then I'll get on with recognizing individuals. Thanks for joining us, Doug. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, and thanks for going after the award, and thanks for earning the award, because uh, you have to all earn it to, to get it. So uh, we in the retail industry certainly appreciate when all you teachers are doing such a fine job to uh, be one of the top 5% uh, school districts in the nation for music education. It's, that's just awesome. So that's one of the most fun parts of my job is getting to celebrate great work. You know, it, uh, you guys make it easy to do our jobs. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce our music teachers who bring uh, the gift of music to our students all year long. Teachers, as I read your name, please give a wave. Uh, first of all, Sarah Abelson. Mike Anderson, Liz Anderson, Mona Anderson, Becky Ash. <laughs> you want to introduce your friend, Becky? <laughs> um, 
A very important part of classes is Teddy. Uh, thank you. Uh, Seth Boyd. Heidi Bundy. Heidi, thanks for all your help with getting this award for everyone and uh, getting this recognition together. Carol Carlson. David Davis. Dan Erickson. Sarah Finn Sommerfeld. Jay Skinkle. Karen Goats. Joel Goats. Jen Hazen. Mary Hegri. Mary Beth Hutlin. Michael Jenny. Jenny Kimball. Aaron Kors. Aaron, thanks for a great job with the uh, choir at the Rotary yesterday. Appreciated that. Uh, Wade Luterbein. I saw Wade. Uh, Melanie McIver. Jana mm -hmm. Menke. Nathan Mitchell. Kristen Moon. Miles Martinson. Patrick O'Keefe. Cheryl Pacall. Nick Ramundi. Paul Rosen. Melanie Schwartz. Lisa Thomas. Mary Wearsome. And Amber Yang. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you for your expertise and for leading outstanding programs to benefit our entire community. Have a great evening. Our final recognition for this evening is the Prudential Spirit of Community Awards. Every November, Minnetonka hosts the Presidential Volunteer Service Award celebration. At this event, the district recognizes students who volunteer their time and talents to serve the greater good. From that large group, several middle school and high school students are nominated for the Prudential Spirit of Community Awards. The selection process is very competitive. Many of our nominees have held volunteer leadership roles for many years. Tonight, we are recognizing students who have earned either a certificate of achievement or a Certificate of Merit through the Prudential Spirit of Community Awards program. Students earning a Certificate of Achievement will move forward to represent Minnetonka in the state level competition. Our principals notified each Certificate of Achievement winner of their accomplishment with a surprise virtual visit at one of their club or committee meetings. We are pleased to share those celebration moments with you this evening, along with a few details of each honoree's volunteer work. The following students have received the Certificate of Achievement. Ava Chen, Minnetonka High School, motivated by the desire to promote inclusivity and support for students in her community. Ava serves as the Communications Chair on the My Health Teen Clinic Youth Advisory Board. She also acts as a peer tutor in the Academic Anchor Program at Minnetonka High School. This summer, Ava created a virtual debate camp for students in Minnetonka community. Through these endeavors, she has enjoyed engaging in projects that can help her peers. Right before we do the agenda, there is actually a special guest that wanted to say something real quick. Let's see. Well, hello. Hi, Ava. Hi, Lyndon. Hi, Paige. My name is Jeff Erickson. Uh, I'm the uh, principal, and I'm here today to um, we something a little bit different this year with one of the more uh, prestigious awards that we give out at the high school and middle school level, uh, which uh, is for the Prudential Service and the Spirit of Community Awards. And so every year this time we go through the nominations and uh, had a pretty good number this year. 
And if you're not familiar with what the Prudential Spirit of Community Award is, it's, it's the largest uh, youth recognition program based exclusively on volunteer community service. And so it was created in 1995 by the National Association of Secondary School Principals. And so I, along with several others, review all the applications. And uh, this year, the high school has three students that will win this award and be presented with the award at the January school board meeting. Um, but we want to do a little bit more this year to really honor uh, the three from the high school and do a little more story about their work. And uh, Ava, you are one of the three uh, that will be selected this year for the Community Service Award. So uh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. It was such uh, a good surprise. Josie Frandup of Benetuck High School has been a letter writer her whole life. In ninth grade, Josie participated in a volunteer project writing to senior citizens. She was inspired to create a club at Minnetonka High School that focuses on this valuable outreach. Minnetonka Mail has more than 20 members who exchange letters multiple times a month with residents in local senior communities. Josie feels this is an important way to show compassion and empathy for others. She and her fellow club members have developed connections with seniors that they will cherish throughout their lives. Hey, Mr. Erickson, I see you are in my class and I'm just wondering, what on earth are you doing here? Well, I just would like to, to, to learn some more about English. Is this the right spot? It is. Uh, it's awesome to see everyone today uh, virtually. Uh, and uh, I'm here just to, to um, share a little bit of information with you that uh, I don't know if you're aware of what's called the Prudential Spirit of Community Award. Um, this is a pretty big award that is given out in high schools throughout the nation. It actually is the largest youth recognition program based exclusively on volunteer community service. And so uh, every year we go through a process at the high school where students will apply. We had a record number of students apply this year. We selected three students uh, from the high school to receive this award. Um, it's sponsored by the Prudential uh, a Company and then also the National, National Association of Secondary School Principals, NESSP, that honors students for really outstanding service to local, state, and at the national level. So um, there are three students, and today uh, I'm here to honor one student who has been selected, and uh, the student will go on to, we'll have a brief interview later this week. Uh, and then uh, put together a short video just to honor the service. Um, it's what I hope that every single student gives back. Uh, but this year's, uh, this year's one of our three is in this class, and that person you know, is Josie Frandro. So congratulations, Josie. Thank you. Catherine Liu of Benetonka High School has been a dedicated leader of the Unified Club at Benetonka High School for the past two years. Unified Club enables students, both with and without disabilities, to participate in sports and other activities together. Additionally, Catherine serves on the Student Board of Directors for Special Olympics Minnesota. Motivated by her work with the Unified Club, Catherine has also become a personal care assistant for people with disabilities. Hey, Mr. Erickson. Hey, how are you guys doing? Well, I'm uh, here on official business. We give what's called the Prudential Spirit of Community Award. And it's really about service. And um, this is a, a, the largest award um, recognition program, youth recognition, pro youth recognition program in the nation around volunteer and community service. So this is a big award. Um, and it was created in 1995 uh, by the National Association of Secondary School Principals. Um, and it really, again, honors service. And Minnetonka High School each year has a number of students who apply for this award. Uh, it goes through a pretty rigorous screening process. And, um, and then we select uh, students and we select three students that really exemplify service and, uh, and do great things for our school. So today I'm here to give our award. Uh, and then um, we want to be able to uh, honor this person, then we'll, we'll have a follow-up interview uh, with this person uh, another time this week to ask a few questions. And then we'll be putting together a little video about each of the three recipients of this prestigious award. And so um, I'm really pleased to announce that uh, uh, this year's, one of, our, one of our winners this year, one of our three winners this year is Catherine Liu. 
So congratulations. Thank you. And Sarah Erickson, Minnetonka Middle School West student, is an active member of Minnetonka Middle School West Service Club. Her work with the club has inspired her to give back to the community in multiple ways. She has raised money to buy books for Bruce Vento Elementary, supported wildlife relief efforts in Australia, sang at nursing homes, volunteered at an Animal Humane Society, and spent nearly 70 hours making masks during the pandemic. Through her acts of service, Sarah has recognized how giving back has benefited both those she serves and herself. I wanted to make an announcement here for the service club to congratulate Sarah Erickson, who will receive a Certificate of Achievement for the Prudential Spirit of Community Award Program. She is going to represent Minnetonka in the state level competition for this Prudential Spirit of Community Award Program. So Sarah, congratulations. Sarah, you were just here. Wait, there you Thank are. You. Way to go, Sarah. I know that you have been contributing so many hours and doing so much this past year, uh, and you have such a heart for service, and we're just so proud of your work. The following two students also did amazing volunteer projects, and they will receive a certificate of merit in recognition of their hard work. They're both runners-up for the Prudential Spirit of Community Award. Virginia Morrow, Minnetonka High School student, has volunteered nearly 500 hours this year. Her volunteer work has focused on the civic realm as she has worked on political campaigns and encouraged people to engage in their government and exercise their right to vote. Through her work, Virginia recognized the importance of getting people involved in local, state, and national government. And Phoebe Hansen, Minnetonka High School, Phoebe volunteered 313 hours this year. She engaged in several volunteer activities at Minnetonka High School, including acting as a leader of the Haiti Outreach Club. Phoebe's work strengthened her passion for building awareness of global issues and helped illuminate how impactful a group's work can be on projects thousands of miles away from Minnetonka. Thanks to all of our award recipients for being outstanding leaders. That concludes our recognition program this evening. Thank you for joining us. The school board meeting will begin shortly. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the January 7, 2021 school board meeting to order. <laughs> I have my um, little gavel at home here this evening. Um, can we all rise and say the pledge to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the public it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, can I have a motion, please, to adopt a, tonight's agenda? Thank you, Lisa. Is there a second? 
Mark, thank you very much. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? All right, seeing none, um, we uh, motion, uh, we'll go to a roll call vote. Carrie? Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Board member Vitali? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. All right, motion carries. We have an agenda this evening. Tonight is um, the first meeting of the calendar year or is always our organizational meeting. So we'll start off our uh, meeting with the election of the school board officers for 2021. The first position we will um, discuss this evening and just to let the board members, members know we have, we'll take each of these individually and vote on them as we go. So the first office that we'll elect is the chair. Is there um, anybody that would like to nominate somebody for chair? Hey, Katie. Katie? Yes? Can you hear me okay or am I echoing? No, I can, hear, can you. hear you. I can't see you. John, if you would like to nominate somebody, go for it. I do. Let me, uh, I don't know why my camera is not on. It, it's on. But we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I would like to nominate um, Chris Vitale for the board chair position. So I haven't had a chance to get to know Chris for quite a few years and then ultimately see him as a peer, a uh, fellow board member for the Minnetonka Schools, um, you know, really for the last number of years. And I've just really been impressed with Chris's thoughtful approach, his attitude, um, the involvement that he has in the community, the listening skills he has, but also um, balancing all of that ability to really listen to the community with his ability to think strategically about what are some of the most important things that we need to address as a district um, and then I would say working collaboratively with all of us board members to make sure that he is getting input from us, but also making sure that we understand some of the strategic imperatives that we need to address as a board to keep the Minnetonka district moving forward. So um, for, for the reasons of compassion from listening and from strategy, um, I think Chris Vitale would be an outstanding board chair for the upcoming school year, for the upcoming, upcoming uh, committee year. Thank you. Thank you, John. Is there anybody else that has um, that would like to nominate somebody? All right. Seeing none, none. Chris, do you accept that nomination? Yes, I do. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, great. Um, let's move to a roll call vote. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. If you wish to abstain, please say I abstain. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Aye. Board Member Becker? Aye. Board Member Holcomb? Aye. Board Member Lesage? Aye. Board Member Ritchie? Board Member Vitale? I abstain. Board Member Wagner? Aye. And I will second the motion. Thank you. Oh, did I forget that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Going on with the bang. I do it every year. <laughs> well, good. Um, uh, th th thank you, Katie. Thank you, John. For, uh, I appreciate it, and I appreciate the confidence of the board and hope to uh, do it justice this year. And uh, I just want to thank Katie uh, publicly for a great year as chair. I really appreciate uh, that. Um, as being vice chair, really um, her being a mentor, and, um, you know, it was a very... Um, big year for for uh, with everything going on, and, and Katie handled it and, and steered us and navigated us, navigated us through it very well. So thank you, Katie. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Um, you're going to do a great job. Motion carries. I'd like to hand the agenda now over to you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. And so um, now we need to move to vice chair. Uh, do we have any nominations for the office of vice chair? Uh, Christine. Muted. Christine, Christine, you're... it doesn't look like you're muted, but we can't hear you. Huh. 
You want me to move to the next item and she can, nope. 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 Maybe she has to go out and come back in. Um, let's move to, Christine, we'll, we'll move to the next agenda item, I think. Can we do that or should we wait? I would, unless somebody else wants to nominate someone. Does somebody else want to nominate somebody for vice chair or we can come back to that? Mike. Mike? I'd like to nominate Mark M. Rosen. Um, I have the honor of working on the board uh, with Mark for over three years and um, and known Mark probably 10, 10 years outside the board. Um, his attention to detail, um, his work ethic, his integrity, um, you know, his, his obviously conviction and support of the Antarctica School District is second to none. And I think he did an excellent job as vice chair. Good, thank you, Mike. Do we have a second? Uh, Lisa, I think I saw you first. Um, um, so now we'll move to a roll call vote for Mark Ambrosen for vice chair. Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye, oppose, nay. If you wish to abstain, please say I abstain. Board member Ambrosen? I abstain. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Board member Vitale? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. Um, now we will move to clerk. Do we have any nominations for the office of clerk? Oh, I'm sorry, treasurer. Well, let's do treasurer first. Do we have any nominations for the office of treasurer? Mark? I'd like to leave, nominate Lisa Wagner. Um, Lisa brings vast experience with the district, um, guiding us for many years as chairperson in fulfilling many roles uh, throughout the district, outside the school board and inside the school board. Uh, she's going to bring a wealth of attention, experience, um, commitment to the role, and I can't think of anybody better suited to be uh, treasurer this upcoming year. Great. Thank you, Mark. Do we have a second? John, thank you. Uh, do we have any more nominations for the Office of Treasurer? Seeing none, let's move to a roll call vote for Lisa Wagner for the Office of Treasurer. Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye, oppose, nay. If you wish to abstain, please say I abstain. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Board member Vitale? Aye. Board member Wagner? I abstain. Thank you. Great for everybody at home. That was six aye and one abstained. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, congratulations. Um, thank you. I look forward to the opportunity. Now uh, let's uh, move uh, to the office of clerk. Do we have any nominations for clerk? Uh, Lisa. Um, I would like to nominate John Holcomb for the office of clerk. Um, John has been an exceptional board member. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with him for quite some time now, and I think that uh, the attention to detail that's important in the office of clerk John has. Um, he also brings a, a good lens to the board from his background in uh, strategy and um, his medical background has been very important to us as uh, we've, we've navigated these COVID waters. So uh, look forward to continuing to see John contribute to the board in the role of clerk. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, any, uh, can I have a second? Uh, Mike, um, John, I, uh, do you accept the office of clerk? I do and appreciate the board confidence in me in that role. Thank you. Great. Uh, do we have any other nominations? Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion to approve? Um, Roll call, Chris. Uh, uh, what? Roll call. 
uh, sorry, we move to a roll call vote. I was reading my wrong notes. Um, uh, to nominate John Holcomb for, for clerk. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. If you wish to abstain, please say I abstain. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Board member Becker. Aye. Board member Holcomb. Abstain. Board member Lesage. Aye. Board member Ritchie. Aye. Board member Vitali. Aye. Board member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you, John. Uh, that was six aye and one abstain. Um, can I have a motion to approve that the school board appoint Executive Director of Finance and Operations, Paul Bourgeois, as Deputy Clerk, who can act at, on the clerk's behalf on normal and routine business matters, and as Deputy Treasurer to carry out duties as described in law and in his job description. Lisa, I saw you first. Uh, Katie, second. Motion carries. Oh, no, we have to vote. I'll get there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, now we will move to a roll call vote. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Board member Vitali? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, now we will move to our next agenda item, which is the school report from Groveland. Dr. Peterson. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I made a mistake right away too. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes. So I haven't been used to that for a while. <laughs> it's a great honor, uh, of course, to uh, introduce uh, the Groveland uh, presentation. Uh, each year they give a great uh, a list of accomplishments and highlights of the school and I know you'll enjoy tonight's as well. And uh, Mr. Gilbertson is here personally to uh, give the uh, report. So Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Well, I was hoping to be the first person to say Mr. Chair, but it's easy to do it, Dr. Peterson. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Peterson, thanks for having me here tonight to represent Groveland Elementary. Um, and there's some really fun stuff to report tonight that I'll be excited to, but I wanted to start off on uh, a, a slightly different note, and that was just in, in, in light of uh, everything that has happened this, this past year in particular, I wanted to thank the board for the support um, that you've given our, our staff, both from the district level, um, teach building level. It's been um, incredibly important because this has been such a taxing year, as you know, for our staff, our teachers and para support staff. Um, and district level uh, staff have, have really poured forth themselves and sacrificed quite a bit mentally and emotionally and physically. And, um, I think sometimes that can get lost in the wash because so much good stuff is happening, but I want to keep it um, in, in mind because we, we want to continue to support all of them um, as, as you have and continue to do that. So thank you for, for hearing that and continuing that fantastic support um, for our staff. And then I don't get many opportunities to publicly thank some, some people that really work behind the scenes at our building, so I wanted to just really point out some in particular in our office this year have, who have put forth incredible efforts. Elizabeth Little, our head office assistant, has done remarkable work. She does it with such class and grace and really keeps things moving well in our building. Uh, Emily Westland, who is the first face that you see when you come to Groveland, if you've been there, she's the warm, welcoming person, um, ready to help. Uh, and, and always willing to pitch in where she can, and she's been a remarkable presence in our building. Um, our administrative support, Andrea Hoffman, um, could not have done this year without her. She's like having another principal in the building. She's smart and um, really efficient and willing to do anything, and she really works hard. I'm really grateful for her support. And then our office staff, uh, this year in particular, with all the contact tracing, I, I wish I could have brought in the multiple three ring binders that they have filled up doing their contact tracing and communicating with parents, but Patty Stang, our nurse, um, and then the health office assistants, Carrie Rotman and Alyssa Tornas, have just done remarkable work, um, working long hours and, and really making sure they've had to keep pay attention to so many details to keep our kids and our families and staff safe and, um, and have done incredible work, as, as you know. The, the infection rates and, and spread has been incredibly low and I really credit them in leading that. And then finally, two more, Mary Haugie. We call her Chef Mary. She's the head cook. She keeps everybody fed, 
um, and has done really uh, incredible work turning around a whole different system, a way of delivering food to individual classrooms. She does it with a smile. She never complains, and, um, and she and her staff have done great work. And then finally, Greg Merck, our custodian, kept us safe, kept our, our building clean and sanitized, and all of these people have done, uh, just like the teachers and, and pairs and the rest of our staff, done incredible work to keep us moving. So I wanted to thank them publicly, and thank you again for your support of them. Um, one of the things that's come up is, is uh, the, the fact that we've been able, able to offer for this child care option to families has been um, incredibly important for our families. And so I just wanted to highlight a few families that just reported how, how much of a difference it made for them. So um, the first two are from parents that you know, said they, they might have had to quit their job had they not have had that child care option. One a single mom and, and another a, a, a working mom that just doesn't see how they, they would have been able to keep both of them. So it made an incredible financial impact for them, and I know they're representative of many families. Uh, another one who really noted the impact it had on their child has some special needs and really kept him on track and connected uh, in some really meaningful ways. Um, so they were very grateful for that. And, and one of them, and this is just a handful of the, the families that have responded, but another one is a teacher in our district. So she was able really to give a much better, higher quality experience to our Minnetonka students because we had that child care option open for the people that needed it. So again, thank you for making that a possibility. Um, it's, it's made a huge difference for our families um, and excited to, for the new possibilities that we have moving forward. Um, our building has been successful in a lot of different ways this year, and one of them has been our family community that supports it, of course, led by our PTO. So I don't know how they've done it, but our PTO has managed to continue to run the same fall fundraisers that they typically have done. They've either hit or exceeded the marks in terms of how engaged students have been. In this case, it's a readathon, so how many minutes, still over half a million minutes were read this year by our students. Um, and in terms of the support they were able to raise, still the same amount, if not more. In fact, our a book fair that's associated with the readathon was one of the top five book fairs in the whole in the whole country. Um, I don't know where they ended up, but they were at that at that mark for a little while. So really remarkable the work they've done, and then it produces um, that consistent, fantastic uh, experience that we're used to giving to our families and students. So they doubled the size of our playground. They um, they were able to get uh, uh, playground equipment to even in person our excuse me e learning families, um, so that kids could continue to stay active and engaged. Uh, both at home and at school. Um, they continue to do great work thanking our teachers and making sure they feel appreciated and supported. Um, I just can't say enough about our families and, and the success that they brought to our um, building. There have been um, still continuing work on the goals, the board goals. So in particular, I want to talk tonight about uh, goal one and goal two. Um, in goal one, you know, we recognize, um, like everything else in, in uh, in society, we're having to either do not do things or do things differently or delay them. So this is just a few of the things. For example, our kindness retreat, we just had to delay it. I think we have a chance uh, in April is it our new, our new um, date. And we have a chance maybe to do that in person or something similar to in person. So um, still reserving the opportunity to do some of those things. Um, things like SST, which are our student support team. You know, that's of course gone virtual, but really we haven't missed a beat in terms of um, how Joanne Komenecki and, and Andrea Hoffman have led that. We're still serving similar numbers of families and students and, and really effective, effectively supporting uh, teachers and, and students in that. Um, some of the things are still happening, but in different ways. Of course, our interventions, they're still happening, but they're virtual. Um, so pe people have adjusted to that. Um, we are still collecting data that we did, but it's done in a little different way. So we're making some adjustments in how we do things while still accomplishing the same goals that we had set out to accomplish at the beginning of the year. Um, and then there's been some surprises. So some things, as we've had to do them differently, have actually offered some advantages that we can look at in the future um, when, when we're back to a typical school year. Uh, maybe these are some things we could consider in the future. So for example, uh, teachers, just through observation, we noticed that in the that tier one, which is the general classroom setting, um, have actually been able to spend in some ways more time one-on-one -on -one with students because there hasn't been the need if students are online, there has been the need for them to move back and forth around the building and do some of those transition pieces. So um, teachers do things like uh, breakout rooms or office hours where they open up a Google Hangout and kids can come and visit them. A lot of times kids want to just check in and say hi. Um, they also, of course, get academic support. Um, 
Uh, and teachers, of course, have leveraged to the hilt all of the technology that we've provided them um, and the students. Uh, so that goal one, still making, it looks different of course this year, but we're still making progress towards that. Again, a big thanks to our staff for being innovative in, in what they do and then seeing the opportunities that come with, um, with this new change. Goal two is another one that I wanted to talk about tonight, and excellence in belonging, and I know, you know the board has, has a long list of things that they want to accomplish in this, and I think uh, obviously some fantastic um, pieces in there. So one of them was hiring, and this year offered uh, uh, some unique opportunities because we hired a lot of people uh, this year, and we still had um, the same standards, so we're still hiring really quality people, but because we had um, a, a big pool to pick from, we had an opportunity to hire a little more diverse staff than, than we typically have. So we, we try to interview, um, and in this case, we were able to hire about 20, about a quarter of our new staff um, came from diverse backgrounds. So um, what a great opportunity for, for students and, and other staff members to get a chance to interact with people who have a, a little different perspective and really bring something extra to, to our uh, staff, and they've been fantastic um, additions. Um, the hiring is also allowed with this uh, a little more diversity. Um, students can connect um, with somebody that maybe has a little more of a similar experience to them um, in terms of their cultural background or just their experiences, and I think that's been helpful for, for, um, for different students in particular. Certainly it's been helpful for all of us in general. Um, another thing uh, around this goal is that we have really begun to prioritize more of those personal connections, recognizing that um, when students have a personal connection to um, more, more than one um, staff member, we know they're going to feel more included. Um, they're going to have a better sense of belonging, and obviously we know that's going to have a positive impact on how, they, um, on how they perform. So we've had more opportunities in this setting to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring, again, similar to what the teachers found. Um, our paras and teachers have a better opportunity to, both virtual and in-person, do some one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Um, one of the kind of neat examples that has happened is our third grade um, traditionally has done an immigration project, and they've actually made this change back. It's been a couple of years now. Um, and the, prior to this, they did kind of a, um, a simulation, like an Ellis Island type of simulation. It was a really neat experience. Um, and it represented one type of, or one story of immigration that was um, very rich and meaningful. And I think they've added to that, um, a, a, um, and instead of that, they're doing a, an experience where the students go out and they interview someone who has immigrated to our country. So um, it might be a famous person that they actually, instead of interviewing, they research, or they have a family member, a friend, um, aunt, uncle, that has had that experience. And so it's actually really inspiring to see this, the stories that these kids um, have found out where somebody that they know has come over, maybe not known the language well, maybe not had a lot of resources, and now they're standing there with a picture of them getting receiving their doctorate, and how proud those kids are to be part of that story, see um, the, the positive, um, stories of, of immigration and how much it's really contributed to our country even to today. So that's been um, one way that we've really shifted some things to get more of a personalized connection, to really um, boost that excellence and belonging. Uh, the staff have opportunities to share their own experiences as well um, with, with each other. Um, of course, we, we look to inject um, additional cultural experiences all year long, but certainly February is a great opportunity for us to highlight Black History Month. Um, and so, similar to last year, we'll be doing um, some, some of the same things and some new things. So we're, we're, we're probably going to be virtual for most of it right now, um, but we have an author and a storyteller, Excelsior Elementary, has been really instrumental in, in, in helping find um, some, some great resources, and, and um, we have co collaborated with them to use some of those same resources as well as adding some additional ones we found. But they'll come and give a great experience for students to learn about and then have opportunities to discuss um, different cultures. And then we have a staff member, he's a para, Mr. York, Marvin York, he's been with us for a while, um, a beloved staff member, he's an African American gentleman that's um, out on the playground if you see him, he's in the playground, he's in the classroom, he is everywhere. Um, and he is uh, uh, somebody that has, has volunteered to have an opportunity to share with kids um, what a different experience from, from many of them might look like, and then what does it mean to show people how to belong and, and include people. And um, so we really feel like, um, in terms of excellence and belonging, one of the things that we can leverage is people that are right in our midst, whether it's students or staff members, um, leverage their experiences and their um, willingness to, to share with others. 
So we're excited about the, the progress that we've made and, and the new directions that we're taking in that. Um, we have had to make some adjustments overall, um, things like our playground. So in our playground, it's sectioned off into different areas, and so kids, um, of course, still have to be uh, uh, socially distant. Um, uh, the advantage is kids get around the whole playground instead of just going to the monkey bars every day or playing soccer. Um, pick up and drop off, we've had to use some technology to, to change that, but again, just looking at the innovation of our staff, it's actually worked out very well. Um, and then another one of those surprises that we didn't anticipate, we've gone to, uh, this year we had to do all virtual uh, kindergarten information nights. We ended up actually with about 30, 35% more participation from parents than we would in a typical year. Uh, and you probably can't see the quote there, but the quote was really, hey, we've been to other um, open houses and other, other districts, and this one was the best. You know, We still got the information and the connection they needed. We actually got probably about four times as many questions from parents because of, of how we ran the questioning. Um, and uh, uh, Andrea Hoffman still had me run around and give a virtual tour, so I got to work out of, out of the deal as well. <laughs> um, but uh, again, some of those surprising things that have happened in the midst of this difficult time, um, that happens when you have a great staff that knows how to innovate um, and a great uh, district that knows how to support. And then specials have looked a little different, so instead of doing specials in the classroom, um, we, we've moved some people around, so there's a para that lets the kids watch their lesson in the classroom, then takes them down to the gymnasium to keep them active. So just some of those examples of, of how things are different, um, but in some ways um, we're really learning some advantages. We're trying to continue to build a strong culture at Groveland. We've always had a great culture, a great um, uh, staff, not only experienced, but just fun people that like to be around each other and are fun to be around, so we try to continue that. So uh, Andrea and I have office hours where we just have a Google Hangout and people come. Sometimes they have questions, sometimes they just come and say, I just wanted to say hi, so it's fun to get a chance to connect with people in a little more of an informal setting. Uh, we do game night uh, on some Friday nights, so uh, if you're ever interested to find out some of the most embarrassing moments of our staff, for example, you can take a quiz show and find out some of those things. I invite Dr. Peterson at any point if he wants to uh, send us some of those things, we can be part of the, our quiz. Um, but that's a, a fun way, again, just to connect on a Friday for 20 minutes, half hour, play some bingo and, and enjoy each other's company. Uh, and then uh, Emily Westland does our daily newsletter for staff and they have shout outs. So it's really fun to see staff just say simple things like, hey, thanks for taking my kids for 10 extra minutes of recess. It helped me take care of some things I needed to and to see the staff bond and, and um, encourage each other. Um, and at Groveland, they, they excel at that. So really, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things we've learned, but kind of thinking through some of the bigger things we've learned. Um, Number one, it's a team that accomplishes all these things. So paras support staff, our district administration and administrative staff, um, our families, our teachers have all really uh, worked together to pull this off. And then we do have an incredible staff and, and, um, and incredible families, and I think both are so important to the success of our students and our staff. Um, the, the staff have really found new ways to establish those strong relationships and do it quickly and do it virtually. It's not the same. Certainly we're looking forward to the day when we can invite families back into the building in, in more numbers, but um, they've done a great job to um, work with what they have. Um, and then just understanding that some of these experiences that we have been forced into in some ways or we've had to do have actually come with some great lessons and things that we may carry forward uh, moving on. Um, and then again, just highlighting how important that planning time and support for the staff has been and really thanking you, the board, for supporting them. Every minute that they've had, they've really used well, um, and I know they've appreciated it. And um, I don't know if they would ever say we've had too much, uh, so I'm sure <laughs> more is always welcome, but, um, but what they've had has been incredibly valuable and helpful, and as we've made these transitions, um, it's been, it's been a, a great boon to them and, um, and great for our students overall. That is... Groveland in a nutshell this year. Uh, I'm open to any questions that you might have. Andy, can we um, uh, have that, the, or can I see the grid again, please? Um, are there any questions or discussion feedback uh, for Principal Gilbertson? Um, I just saw you guys. Oh, John, thank you. Yeah, not a question, just a thank you. Um, thank you for really leaning into this goal. Thank you for your efforts on attracting talent to meet the diverse needs of our students. 
and uh, thank you for again being a leader in your one of the first schools we've heard from is really taking this much of a proactive approach and I appreciate all you're doing to really drive that excellence and belonging in your school. So thank you. Thank you, John. Yes, uh, anyone else? Thank you, John. Great, I'm not seeing any other. Thank you, Principal Gilbertson. Thank I you. really appreciate it. Um, I really love uh, the update and um, I love the idea of the immigration project. I think yeah. that is so great. Um, for um, our young st uh, families or young kids to get uh, that experience uh, uh, from uh, someone from somewhere else that has come here. It's such a unique perspective. I really appreciate it. So yeah. thank you. Thank your staff. Uh, uh, we really appreciate it. I will. Thank you. Have a good night. Mm -hmm. You too. Okay. Uh, now is uh, we've reached a time for community comments. Um, we are uh, since we are meeting virtually, we're operating under the virtual statute. So we had asked for all comments to be emailed in to Carrie uh, by noon. Um, Carrie, have we received any community comments? We have. We received five from community members, and I will read them now if that is okay. The first comment comes to us from Ella Papp, and she writes. Hello, my name is Ella Papp. I am a student at MHS, and I live in Minnetonka at 5720 Scenic Heights Drive near the high school. I am writing to you to talk about the school board policies to be discussed tonight, specifically 514, Bullying Prohibition, 604, Inclusive Education, and 606, Controversial Topics and Materials. My main concern with the current bullying policy is that it does not allow students to know about administrative actions taken against staff who committed discriminatory actions against them. I feel that this lack of transparency does little to correct future transgressions and also creates distrust between students and the administration because victims of discrimination never get closure and feel dismissed. I ask that students involved in bias incidents be made aware of the specific actions taken to resolve the incident and that they be connected to therapeutic resources to manage the emotional impact associated with this kind of trauma. In regards to the inclusive education program, the issue is with the language of the policy. The current phrasing is vague and exclusionary, which won't hold curriculum designers accountable for providing inclusive education. For example, the policy does not specifically state the need to teach about BIPOC people and their contributions, only about all people. It also does not outline the need to teach about the contributions of the trans and non-binary community, instead using language that enforces a gender binary specifying all men and women. The majority of the current curriculum is already focused on white, neurotypical, able-bodied, straight, cisgender men. An inclusive education program policy should exist to balance that by specifying a need to teach about the contributions of BIPOC, neurodiverse, and disabled people, and people of all genders with an emphasis on women and those outside the gender binary. Our school prides itself on excellence, and there can be no excellence without equity. Finally, controversial topics and materials. The oversight of this policy is the lack of an anti-discrimination statement. Without this, any objection to teaching topics like the BLM movement or queer trans sexual health could label those topics controversial requiring educators to bring in speakers with an opposing viewpoint that would essentially be anti-human rights. This acts as a deterrent to teaching anti-oppression rhetoric, which is seriously problematic. An anti-discrimination statement that specifies that any resistance movement to oppression cannot be considered controversial is critical to teaching our students that human rights are not debatable. The next comment comes to us from Lisa Dorniker, and she resides at 2744 Terrace View Court in Plymouth. She writes, Dear Manitaka School Board, I am a current parent of a third grader in your district. His natural trajectory is to remain in the district for another nine years and graduate. However, as a white parent who is trying to raise my son to be racially conscious and honor the experiences of his BIPOC and LGBTQA plus peers, I am hesitant to commit to remaining in this district. The current racial and non-inclusive environment of our buildings is extremely Eurocentric. And given the events in DC just yesterday, we have seen the destruction and violence that comes with not acknowledging reality. 
I am also a fellow educator. I am a licensed school counselor. And in three months, I will obtain my K-12 administrator's license. So this is also a call for accountability as a peer and colleague of yours in this field. I have worked on rewriting district policies in the Minneapolis public schools and can bear witness to the detrimental impact to all of our students when we do not address language. Adopt the recommendations presented to you today by the Minnetonka Coalition for Equitable Education. I appreciate the allyship demonstrated already by Christine Ritchie and Mark Ambrosen in this work. As a parent, I have the right to know if one of my child's teachers has been called on a bias-related incident. Adopt the recommendations for policy 514. Adults can be bullies too. Discussing race and human rights is not controversial. I want my son's teachers to display BLM and LGBTQA plus flags in their classrooms. I fully support policy 606. They is a pronoun, my son is nine, and honors the existence of non-binary folks. Catch up and revamp policy 504. The name of your school district is that of the Dakota tribe, meaning great water. If you can represent Minnetonka, but not adopt changes to policy 604 and offer an inclusive education program that recognizes the history of your own name and the native land you currently occupy, what does that say about you? This movement will not go away. There are parents in your district who are raising our white children to be accomplices to anti-racist work and to be interrupters of these oppressive systems you are upholding. They will challenge teachers in classrooms. Are you equipping your educators for these moments? Are you willing to risk declining enrollment as this generation of parents and students seek anti-racist and inclusive learning environments, which we consider to be great? Or will you instead spend millions to rename and rebrand your school district? The next comment comes from Sarah Brown, and she resides at 1800 Pheasant Drive in Excelsior. She is commenting regarding agenda item 15K, which is approval of community comments and citizen input expectations. She writes, as stated in the guidelines, citizen input and community comments are provided as opportunities for the public to address the board. While there are many avenues for communicating with the school board members, those who choose to provide citizen input or community comments do so with the intention of their remarks being made publicly. As such, I recommend that edits to the guidelines retain, with modification, the commitment that responses be shared at a future regularly scheduled board meeting. Many comments offered at a study session or a board meeting warrant only a simple acknowledgement, but for those, including a specific query, the response thereto should likewise be made public. To that end, as a replacement to the strikeout of the phrase, if additional research is needed, responses will be shared at a future regularly scheduled board meeting, I suggest amending the proposed new draft phrasing to read as follows. If there is any follow-up to your comments or suggestions, you will be contacted by a member of the board or administration. Responses to specific queries raised in a public meeting of the school board will be shared at a future regularly scheduled board meeting. Additionally, I would like to commend the board for the accommodations extended to the community in response to pandemic-related restrictions on public gatherings. I advocate for permanently retaining live streaming, for example, via YouTube, for all public meetings of the school board, and for continuing to accept and read aloud citizen input and community comments submitted in writing prior to published deadlines. These simple accommodations encourage robust community discourse by removing impediments to participation. Thank you for your consideration. The next comment comes from Kirby Crow, and Kirby writes, good evening, my name is Kirby Crow, class of 2015, and my address is 18505 Minnetonka Boulevard. My comment concerns policies 514 and 604. First, I would like to thank Christine Ritchie and Mark Ambrosen for using an anti-racist lens in drafting a new dress code policy. The time and effort you both put into rewriting the policy demonstrates your commitment to goal number two. I encourage the remainder of your colleagues to follow your example of leadership and replicate those same efforts. For policy 514, I advise the board to include bias-related incidents into the definition of bullying. In December, two students in the district contacted the MCEE group 
to report two different teachers who made homophobic, transphobic statements. Note, they came first to the MCEE rather than use your Let's Talk tool. Although one student did inform MHS principals of the incident, the student was not given any detailed follow-up. I urge the school board to provide investigative updates to victims, including the final decision, and specific ramifications for the perpetrator. I request that victims of bias-related incidents be connected to therapeutic, district, or communal resources to manage the emotional impact and trauma associated with the incident. If you want to make a student feel like they belong, then the district needs to recognize and help heal the emotional harm the original incident imposed. Now regarding policy 604. I recommend the school board replace section three definitions, subpoint A with this language. Inclusive education program, one that employs a curriculum that is developed and delivered so that students and staff gain an understanding and appreciation of the historical and contemporary cultural diversity of the United States and the tribal nations who were and are the original inhabitants of the land in which the United States currently resides on. The curriculum will include the following, contributions of all genders with specific emphasis on women, trans, and gender nonconforming individuals, the contributions of people with diverse abilities with specific emphasis on people with disabilities, and the contributions of people of all races with a specific emphasis on American Indians, Alaskan Natives, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Black Americans, and Hispanic Americans. I make this recommendation for three reasons. First, it requires educators to teach Native American history before colonization. Second, it uses gender-inclusive language and incorporates the accomplishments of trans and gender nonconforming individuals. And third, it helps balance the representation of racial groups by prioritizing underrepresented racial groups in Minnetonka's curriculum. To clarify, the language detailing the inclusion of specific racial groups is dictated in Minnesota State Statute 3500.0550 in which this district policy is based off of. The last comment comes to us from Lena Pock and she writes, Hello, members of the board. My name is Lena Pock, and I reside at 15835 Woodgate Road South in Minnetonka. I am commenting to address adopting district policies 514, 604, and 606. I would first like to thank Christine Ritchie and Mark Ambrosen for their extensive work in rewriting district policy 504 dress code. Thank you for listening to and addressing student and community concerns to ensure that all students, including students of color and queer students, can feel safe and comfortable at school. The MCEE has sent you a longer list of recommendations for the policies being reviewed tonight that I hope you take into consideration. And I would like to focus on one of these recommendations that is especially important to me. In Policy 606, Controversial Topics and Materials, the district's current definition of a controversial topic is too broad in that it allows for anything to be deemed objectifiable by community members. This means subjects like the Black Lives Matter movement or queer trans sexual education could be deemed controversial. Per current policy, if an outside speaker comes in to talk about BLM, then the district policy requires an additional speaker with an opposing viewpoint. This makes educators less likely to bring in outside speakers because they are afraid that they would have to bring in speakers who are anti-human rights. I plead that the school board make an anti-discrimination statement within the policy that clearly states that human rights are not a controversial topic. It should also prioritize inclusive curriculum, protecting the educational needs of BIPOC and LGBTQ plus to become healthy, civically engaged citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. You're welcome. And uh, thank you to the um, five community members that sent in uh, community comments. Great. Um, moving on, we'll move, as Katie said, this is an organizational meeting. We will move back to um, the organization of the school board uh, where we set up our board year. 
Uh, for our board members, we were gonna go through each item individually. Um, it will introduce them and then we'll have a motion. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll have a motion. So uh, the, the first item is uh, fixing the day, time, and place of each regular board meeting. Dr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's uh, an honor to uh, present the uh, proposed uh, board meeting dates for next year. They are all uh, Thursdays, and uh, they're actually the first Thursday of each uh, month of the year. We didn't have to uh, modify those uh, dates at all. And uh, the meetings would uh, begin at seven o'clock and recognitions would be prior to that. So we vary the length of the, uh, or the time of the actual start of recognitions based upon how long we think they'll take. So I would propose those uh, dates for you. Great, thank you, Dr. Peterson. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the school board meeting dates for 2021? I see Lisa, second is uh, Katie. Um, are there any uh, questions or changes? Seeing none, we will move to a roll call vote. Okay. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Board member Becker. Aye. aye. Board member Holcomb. Aye. aye. Board member Lesage. Aye. Board member Ritchie. Aye. aye. Board member Vitali. Aye. Board member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. Great. That is uh, seven ayes. Uh, the motion carries. The next item is fixing the day, time, and place of study sessions. Dr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's an honor also to uh, present these proposed dates and times. Uh, you've fallen with the uh, practice of six o'clock, so I'm recommending that you have uh, six o'clock be your starting time for study sessions during the coming year. Uh, all of them are the third Thursday, except for April, September, and October. Um, so in April, uh, we're varying that because of the uh, timing of spring break and so forth. In uh, uh, September, it's uh, avoiding uh, Yom Kippur. And in uh, October, it's uh, avoiding Education Minnesota, so uh, conference, Education Minnesota conference. So those are the uh, three exceptions. Otherwise, they're all the third Thursday of the month. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Peterson. Can I get a motion to approve uh, the, the day, time, and place of study sessions as presented? Mike, I think I saw you first. Um, Mark, a second. Any questions or comments? We can move to roll call vote. Board members, if in favor, please say aye, oppose nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Aye. Board Member Becker? Aye. Aye. Board Member Holcomb? Aye. Aye. Board Member Lesage? Aye. Board Member Ritchie? Aye. Board Member Vitali? Aye. Board Member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. Great. Uh, with seven ayes, the motion carries. Uh, the next item is the setting of salaries. Uh, Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, this is for the salaries of the board members as well as uh, various positions of the board. I would uh, comment that uh, these salaries have not been changed for several years. Uh, they're certainly not uh, very high as they are and uh, uh, re don't reflect really the amount of work that board members put into this job. It's uh, very time consuming work and uh, as Ms. Becker said earlier, uh, this year was very uh, challenging, and uh, I think you said the same thing, Mr. Chair, that it's been a challenging year for board members to uh, respond to the public, and you've done so in an exemplary way. So right now, uh, the annual salary of uh, board members is $1,500 for the whole year. Excuse me, this is for the uh, chairperson, $1,500 for the chairperson. and. Um, it's been that way for several years, as I said. And then um, 375 per month for all board members. So the chair gets the $1,500 plus 375 as a member throughout the year. Uh, second point is the uh, uh, annual salary for the vice chair is 750. 
and the vice chair does do several uh, uh, other duties in, in addition to ch attending meetings and being ready to chair the meetings if the chair is absent. Um, and uh, third is the uh, clerk and uh, there's really no additional amount paid for the clerk even though they have several responsibilities to carry out. Uh, and that there, uh, for the treasurer, there's no additional amount even though that person also has several extra duties to carry out. And then uh, fifth uh, is the overall salary of the board that I've already mentioned at 375 a month. And then uh, board members can receive a stipend of $50 per meeting that they're from the committees and all that they're assigned to, uh, to uh, represent the board uh, for up to four standing committee meetings per month. So they have a limit of $200 if they're attending meetings on behalf of the board. So those are the recommendations. Those are where you are now, and uh, they would rep represent the recommendation. It would certainly be appropriate if the board chose to change any of those amounts. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, can I get a motion to approve the salaries for board members, including chairperson, vice chair, clerk, treasurer, and board directors as presented? Lisa, I think I saw you first, second, Christine. Um, any questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, let's move to a roll call vote. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. aye. Board member Vitali? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with seven ayes, the motion carries. The next item is the, the resolution for designating depositories. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, each year the board needs to approve the depositories that are used for uh, district funds. Uh, several of these are local banks, but there are some that are uh, in New York, for example, that are used for bond proceeds and so forth. So uh, if the public is wondering why we're dealing with uh, uh, banks in New York City, those are needed to uh, deposit bond proceeds and handle other business uh, that's designated by, uh, by the uh, uh, securities uh, requirements that we have. So U.S. Bank in Minneapolis, Wells Fargo in Minneapolis, Alaris Financial in Grand Forks, North Dakota with local banks here, of course. The Minnesota uh, Trust Investment Fund, which is in Albertville, Minnesota. Uh, Chase Manhattan Bank in um, New York City. Uh, Minnesota School District Liquid Assets Fund, which is in Minneapolis. Northland Trust Services in Minneapolis and the Bank of New York Mellon in New York City. Great, thank you, Dr. Peterson. Can I get a motion to approve our depositories as presented? Uh, Mike, uh, first, a second, I think I saw Lisa. Um, any questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll move to roll call vote. Here. Board members, if in favor, please say aye, oppose nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Aye. Board member Vitali? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Great. With uh, seven ayes, uh, motion carries. Our next item is the resolution appointing school attorneys. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, you have uh, employed the uh, services of several uh, uh, law firms over the uh, years for various reasons. And uh, so the law firms that you're now uh, using, and we'd recommend you continue to use them. Uh, first of all is Kennedy and Graven. Uh, they do a lot of our regular work and a variety of topics. Dorsey and Whitney, which uh, tends to do more of our legal work with uh, bonds and so forth. Radwick, Rose, Rozak, and Maloney. Um, are uh, used for some services that we have. Heitzman and Wold, uh, and then uh, 
Mr. Dennis O'Brien, who does some legal work for us, as well as represents the board at the table for teacher bargaining. So I recommend you employ all of those law firms. Good. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, can I get a motion to approve our resolution appointing school attorneys as presented? Um, a first, KD. Uh, second, uh, John. Lisa. John. Um, any comments or questions? Seeing none, um, we'll move to a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Board member Vitale? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. Great, with uh, seven ayes, the motion carries. Our next item is the designation of the official newspaper and alternative dissemination of bids and quotes. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, you uh, need by, to, by law, designate an official newspaper. And uh, the only one that is uh, generally distributed throughout our community now is the Sun Sailor. And so we're recommending that you designate them for legal publications and uh, proceedings, and that you also allow uh, uh, proceedings to also be posted on the district's website, which is an alternative approach. Good, um, thank you, Dr. Pearson. Can I have a motion to approve the Sun Sailor as our official newspaper? Uh, Mark, um, can I have a second? Uh, Katie. Thank you, any comments or questions? Um, it might be a dumb question, Dr. Peterson, but let's say there weren't any local newspapers. I mean, what would we do, we just use the alternative method of the website? No, or the law covers that, and okay. I, I would have it's, to, it's okay. yeah, yep. I'd have to check yep. on the exact We've never had that problem, but okay, yeah. thank you. Yep. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, let's move to a roll call vote. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Board member Vitale? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. Uh, with seven ayes, the motion carries. Um, we moved to our next item, which is the designation of official radio station for emergency announcements. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, we've used uh, WCCO uh, radio, AM radio for a number of years, as do many other districts for emergency announcements and so forth. So even though we now have a more sophisticated system of getting specific messages out through uh, calling trees that we have uh, used for probably at least a dozen years now, as well as emails. Uh, we still use uh, uh, WCCO for announcements, and I think some people rely upon getting those. We also do other emergency announcements on uh, Channel 4, Channel 5, Channel 11, so that uh, that's distributed out there too. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty well covered, but the official act is uh, for WCCO AM. Um, th thank you, Dr. Peterson. Can I have a motion to approve designating WCCO AM as the official radio station during 2021 for emergency school announcements? Uh, Lisa, in a second. Mike, any comments or questions? Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. Okay. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board Member Holcomb? Aye. Board Member Lesage? Aye. Board Member Ritchie? Aye. Board Member Vitale? Aye. Board Member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. Uh, with seven ayes, the motion carries. Our next item is the appointment of auditor, Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, the district's required to have an audit firm uh, designated, and uh, you've used uh, what's now Clifton Larson Allen uh, 
for several years, and they've consolidated in the last, I don't remember, five, six years probably. But uh, as far as we're concerned, administratively, we think they do an excellent job of auditing the books and giving the board and the community a fair representation of the financial operations of the district. And we'd recommend that you uh, use them again this coming year. Great, thank you, Dr. Pearson. Can I have a motion to appoint Clifton Larson Allen LLP to be um, to conduct the annual audit in 2021? Uh, Mark, can I have a second, Lisa? Any comments or questions? Uh, let's move to a roll call vote. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Board member Becker. Aye. Board member Holcomb. Aye. Board member Lesage. Aye. Board member Ritchie. Aye. Board member Vitale. Aye. Board member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. Again, with seven ayes, a motion carries. Our next item is setting of superintendent's evaluation dates. Uh, Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, you do not only an annual evaluation of the superintendent, but a an interim uh, report uh, on progress that's being made throughout the year. So I'm, uh, these are completely flexible. So uh, if you want to change them, change them. <laughs> uh, so I'm proposing uh, February 18th at four o'clock. Uh, that's a board uh, study session date. And uh, recommend that you use that for the mid-year report. Mid-year being used loosely. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, at, for the final evaluation, uh, the self-evaluation presented to the board on uh, June 17th. And then uh, on the 21st of June, the board would come together to develop the evaluation of the superintendent. And then on June 24th, uh, Thursday at six o'clock, the board would review the evaluation with the superintendent. So I recommend those dates. Great, um, thank you. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the setting of superintendent's eva evaluation dates as presented? Uh, Mike, uh, is there a second? Katie, any comments or questions? Uh, a lot of dates for our calendars. Um, uh, <laughs> we'll move to roll call vote. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Board member Becker. Aye. Aye. Board member Holcomb. Aye. Aye. Board member Lesage. Aye. Board member Ritchie. Oops. Oh. Should I go on? She left the meeting. Okay. Board member Vitali. Aye. Board member Wagner. Aye. Board member Ritchie. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with seven ayes, uh, the motion carries. Our next item is setting of mileage allowance for business purposes not covered thereby through negotiated agreements. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, I always smile a bit when I come to this item because uh, for years it was seven cents a mile. That's what, what was allowed. <laughs> and uh, maybe decades it was seven cents a mile. And now the IRS is approving a rate as high as 56 cents. And so you've generally followed that IRS approved rate for uh, board travel, employee travel, it qualifies and so forth. So I'm recommending that you use the 56 cents per mile. Um, thank you, Dr. Peterson. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the IRS approved rate of 56 cents per mile for personal automobile usage for school business purposes in 2021? Uh, Lisa, uh, second, John. Any comments or questions? Mike. Yeah, so, so are we approving that it's gonna, it's gonna vacillate as the IRS changes it or are we approving it's just gonna be a flat 56 for the full year? The, um, the, the question was, are we, um, if the IRS changes it, um, will, we, will we follow that guidance? Um, or will this be they flat usually, through the year? They usually leave that throughout the year. Uh, so different factors might change, but they usually set an annual rate, so it does stay 
constant. I see Paul shaking his head as well. Mike, was that, did I catch your question correctly? Yeah, you did. I, I, I didn't know the frequency of it, it, it modifying, but obviously I, I thought it was more elastic as far as to the extent the prices change and the likes, but as long as it stays that way, that, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Any other comments or questions? We'll move to a roll call vote. Okay. Board members, if in favor, please say aye, oppose nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Aye. Board member Vitali? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you the, want to just do that item on, board, on the committee assignments? Um, I, sure, I sure can. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, with seven eyes, the motion carries. Um, sorry about that. Um, the last item in the organization of school board is the determination of committee assignments. Um, each year the, at the organizational meeting, the board is asked to review and approve the list of committee assignments for 2021. So um, there is a list. Uh, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Sorry, I should have did my math beforehand. 14 committees uh, that the board um, assigns, uh, and we regularly attend meetings. Um, should I go through each one? Do you think? That's your choice. Um, um, I, I can do that. Um, so uh, board members, just um, raise your hand uh, or let me know that we have the 2021 representative uh, correct. The first one is AMSD, which is the Association of Metropolitan School Districts, and that is Katie Becker and Lisa Wagner. Great. The MTA liaisons, which are typically the uh, board chair and vice chair. So that will be myself and Mark Ambrosen. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the finance advisory committee is typically the treasurer. So that is Lisa, Lisa Wagner, excuse me. Uh, the material review, materials review committee is Christine Ritchie. Thank you, Christine. The teaching and learning advisory committee uh, is Mark Ambrosen. Thank you, Mark. Minnetonka Foundation is John Holcomb. Thank you, John. The PTO, PTA leaders is also John. Thank you. Uh, the Special Education Advisory is Christine Ritchie. Thanks, Christine. Tonka Cares is Mike Lesage. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, a new committee this year is um, for, for us is the ment for the board. Uh, as an official committee is the Mental Health Advisory. That's um, Mark Ambrosen. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, case is, I didn't write it down, so we'll just go with Case. Uh, Lisa Wagner and Mike Lesage. Great, thank you, guys. Uh, community Education Advisory is Katie Becker. Preschool and ECF Advisory is also Katie Becker. <laughs> that is a committee I've been on the last two years, so I am sad to see that one go, but I, I know Katie loves that committee, so thank you. And the OPEB advisory is also typically the, uh, the treasurer, so Lisa Wagner. Great. Um, so uh, through the boards. And uh, so this has this gone through quite a few changes. So. We've used a, a red code, we've used a yellow code, we've used the, as I said, the legislative style itself. And uh, you also have the uh, carry-in item, which was sent to you earlier today. I believe that's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. at, yeah. uh, the, as a clean copy. And uh, the one change on that was to get in the change that you had proposed to uh, uh, draw uh, 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 mid thigh on the stick figure, or the uh, I don't know what to call the figure, the straw man or whatever, and then the, the must have straps on the shoulders, and then the entire area from the armpit to the mid thigh must be covered. Uh, that drawing is in our illustration, I should say. So um, I don't think I need to go through all of these changes. You've spent quite a few hours on this policy and. Uh, so I'll turn it back to you to take action. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, just for the community, uh, um, 
Christine is having some connectivity issues, and so um, I asked her to join maybe without her camera. Okay. Um, so um, we will ask her if it resolves, she can turn it back on, but um, that's why her, 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 her camera is off. So okay. just for everybody at home and, and Andy, uh, uh, just let everybody know that. Um, I propose that we start and, and frame a reference as we use the uh, the, clean, the, the one that says clean policy shown with all edits incorporated as of 12 18 20. The, that is the one that was emailed to today, um, the carry in item, with the updated illustration. Um, so um, obviously, this is the seventh reading, but it, um, it, it uh, as was mentioned before, it's gone through some changes. Um, and thank you to Christine and Mark for um, moving us in, uh, in this direction. Um, and so, um, yeah, so it's, it's a reading, so we can open it up for comments and questions. Um, uh, does anybody have any comments or discussion? Um, we can start there. Uh, Lisa. Um, to get the discussion going, I would like to make a motion that we approve the policy as presented in the clean copy with the edits to the illustration. Uh, Katie. I'll second that. <laughs> okay. Um, so it has been moved and seconded, seconded to approve the policy. Um, I believe we go to a vote or if there's any other questions or comments. Yes. Dr. The board Peterson. had asked that we get administrative input relative to the policy and uh, uh, for the most part they felt that it was able to be administered. The one major recommendation they made is to drop the figure. Okay. To take off the illustration and uh, just have the words there which describe uh, you know, what the board expects. That's up to the board to deal with. Um, great. Um, my, my personal, um, so uh, hopefully everybody heard that, um, uh, that, and I forgot to ask, so thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, it was reviewed with administrators, which we've done with all the policies, but with this one uh, undergoing so many changes, we um, asked it to be reviewed. Um, the one piece of feedback was under, um, Section five illustration, just to remove that um, uh, with, the, the, with the updated image. Um, uh, any comments or questions uh, uh, about that? Um, I think it was Mark first. Um, yeah, th thank you, Chair. Um, we had asked that the administrators uh, look this over and give us their opinions and um, I think because they're going to be the ones to implement this, um, if they feel that it's to go without the uh, graphic uh, depiction on the back, I'm absolutely fine with that. Thank you, Mark. Um, Lisa, your hand was up as well. Uh, I would accept that as a friendly amendment to my motion to remove the illustration. Um, Katie, I think. Um. I, I agree with the friendly amendment, but with that friend, friendly amendment, we would also need to amend um, under Roman numeral number three, letter A, remove the word image below. Okay. So in addition to removing the actual image from the policy, we would also then remove the words image below from number three, letter A. Um. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Mark. Um, Christine, I know you can't um, necessarily uh, um, show us that if you just take your mic off uh, in any of this, and, uh, and I, I should be able to see that and call on you. Um, Thank you. Great. Okay, so um, we have uh, a motion that has been seconded to approve the policy and a with a friendly amendment of removing Section uh, 5 illustration as well as under section A, we would get rid of image below in the parentheses. Uh, do I have that uh, correct? I, I believe, uh, Mr. Chair, it's section 3A where the words image below are being removed. Did I say 3A? I apologize. 
Yes. I'm not sure what Mr. Chair said, but that is what I meant. <laughs> okay, so um, Carrie, do you have that? Yes. Okay, yes. so we have a motion on the table with a friendly amendment. Um, any comments or questions? Lisa. Um, I'd just like to echo um, thanks a lot to Mark and Christine uh, for their work. I know we had talked a lot about doing um, subcommittees on a variety of these policies and elected in some cases not to, but I think in this case it was very helpful for the policies, so I appreciate the time and research that they did to um, get us to this point. Thank you, Lisa. Any other um, discussion points or questions? Great. Oh, Lisa. Or, I mean, sorry, Katie. Okay. Uh, I just also, one last time um, before we go to a vote on the policy, I just want to thank the community and our administrators and everybody that has provided feedback to us as we continue to review the policy at each reading. Um, so I just wanted to say one last time to thank you to everybody that uh, provided feedback and input. Um, great point, Katie. I would like to echo that as well. Um, we've received a lot of feedback um, from a lot of different places and appreciate the community's um, support of our work and, and involvement in uh, the update, uh, updating of this policy. So thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Great. Let's um, move to a roll call vote. Okay. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Board member Becker. Aye. Board Member Holcomb? Aye. Board Member LaSage? Aye. Board Member Ritchie? Aye. Board Member Vitale? Aye. Board Member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. With seven ayes, motion carries. Thank you, everybody. All right. Our next item is, oh, I'm on the wrong one. Sorry. <clears throat> get my paper uh, straight, uh, uh, straightened out. Um, our next agenda item is the fifth reading and adoption of goal two re re uh, related policies. Um, again, we've had extensive discussion um, and felt at our last study session that these were ready for adoption. So it's a fifth reading and adoption. Um, I think we will proceed like we have in the past. We will bring each one of these up for motions and, and discussion. Um, and so we will start with policy 514, uh, bullying uh, pro prohibition. Uh, Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, you have done a lot of work on this. Um, much of the uh, wording in this policy has been directed by legislation. And so uh, we've, we've looked at uh, legal opinions on each uh, proposed change and uh, gotten a green light on all of the things that you've proposed so far. But uh, if people are wondering about the nature of the uh, language in the policy, it, uh, it really reflects the directive from the state legislature as to how bullying prevention is to be handled in Minnesota schools. And uh, so much of the uh, uh, policy was written, of course, by attorneys to make sure it reflects the legislation that was passed. So, um, uh, as you indicated at the last study session, you felt that uh, it was ready to be at least considered for adoption. So, I would recommend you adopt this policy. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, yeah, I think. Um, can I get a motion to approve policy 514, bullying prohibition, as presented? Uh, Mark? Uh, second is Katie. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member LeSage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Board member Vitale? Aye. Board Member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. With seven ayes, um, the motion carries. 
Um, we move on to our next item, which is policy 534, equal education opportunity, educational opportunity. Um, Dr. Peterson. Uh, one point I should have made probably with the bullying uh, policy because one, uh, one or more of the uh, speakers tonight ask about uh, having notification of what actions have been taken in the case of bullying or comments by staff. Uh, we're pretty strictly uh, prohibited by Minnesota law from revealing the punishment for employees to anyone else other than the employee who is punished. And the same is true with, uh, with students. Uh, we also are not able to share with others, including the, quote, victim of bullying, what has happened. Uh, and the uh, penalties of law are pretty severe. I mean, there, there have been million dollar settlements because of the uh, failure of, uh, of uh, organizations like Minnetonka School District to uh, adhere to that prohibition against uh, revealing details. So, uh, you know, I know it's frustrating to people. Uh, we're often left at the mercy of the, of the perpetrator, if you will, to tell the story. And often their story is quite different than what really happened to them, but we're not allowed by law to uh, correct them publicly or to anyone who was the victim. So uh, I understand the frustration, but that's, that's the uh, limitation we have under the law. Uh, so the next one is policy 534, equal educational opportunity. Uh, you spent quite a bit of time on this as reflected, it's a relatively short policy, but you, uh, as reflected by the changes that you've made in it, and uh, again, you indicated that you thought it was ready to be adopted, so I would recommend its approval. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, and thank you for your uh, clarification um, on policy 514. Um, great, um, can I get a motion to approve policy 534, equal educational opportunity as presented? Mike? Thank you. Uh, a second? Katie, I think I saw you first and then everybody else. Um, any questions or comments or discussion on this one? Um, great, seeing none, uh, let's move to a roll call vote. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. aye. Board member Becker? Aye. aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Aye. Board Member Lesage. Aye. Board Member Ritchie. Aye. Aye. Board Member Vitali. Aye. Board Member Wagner. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Great. With uh, seven ayes, the, the motion carries. Uh, the next policy is um, Policy 604, Inclusive Education Program. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, this is another policy that you've uh, spent a good deal of time reviewing over the uh, last few weeks, and uh, you indicated that you felt it was ready for approval, and I would recommend you adopt it. Great, um, thank you. Um, can I get a motion to approve policy 604, Inclusive Education Program, as presented? Uh, Lisa, and a second, John. Uh, any comments or questions? Uh, Christine. Okay. Hopefully I can do this with video on. Um, I wanted to propose a friendly amendment or revision in some language, um, just for clarity reasons and then a few community comments taking into account. Um, under section three definitions, um, letter A. Um, hold on one second, I'm gonna read it. Okay, I propose that we change section three definitions A to read inclusive educational program, one that employs a curriculum that is developed and delivered so that students and staff gain an understanding and appreciation of the cultural and historical diversity of the United States. Where it is relevant to the subject matter, the curriculum and instructional materials should include teaching about contributions by people of all cultures, ethnicities, genders, and abilities and disabilities. I feel that that language is a little bit clearer and includes um, some of the feedback that we had gotten from community comments and um, emails to the board. Christine, can you read it one more time? Sure. K 
can you hear me? I had to turn it down because I was getting feedback. Okay. Inclusive educational program. One that employs a curriculum that is developed and delivered so that students and staff gain an understanding and appreciation of the cultural and historical diversity of the United States. Where it is relevant to the subject matter, the curriculum and instructional materials should include teaching about contributions by people of all cultures, ethnicities, genders, and abilities and disabilities. Okay, I probably won't get all of that. Um, and so with that, so we're stopping at the cultural and historical diversity of the United States, I feel that would be period, and then a new sentence that replaces everything after that up to, um, to society by people with disabilities? Um, yeah, and that last sentence. So basically, like you said, um, United States period, and then the remainder of the paragraph would be struck and replaced with where it is relevant to the subject matter, the curriculum and instructional materials should include teaching about contributions by people of all cultures, ethnicities, genders, and abilities and disabilities. I can email that to you right now. Okay. That'd be great. Katie. Yeah. Um, Katie. So a question with that, Christine, in your sentence, does it make sense to only say abilities in, instead of both disabilities and abilities? Sure, up for conversation. Um, I think we have done that in others with all abilities. Well, I think the reason I say that is because we have struck disabilities from mm. the policy in other areas, yep. leaving it as the name or as the word abilities. Um, so um, just to kind of stay with the stride that we have been going for, I would say uh, that's the, that's what I was thinking when I heard you read that. And I didn't get the whole sentence, but um, I mean, so. Yes, that, that's that's totally fine. Carrie, I'll make that change when I email it to you, okay. if everybody please. Okay, um, are Chris, there any Mr. other? What? I have, yep, so, sorry, Dr. Pearson. Uh, Dr. Chair, Pearson. Uh, members of the board, uh, you've already included the word all uh, women and men, but uh, when you talk about all cultures, if you take that literally, we're talking about an exhaust, uh, inexhaustible list, probably, of what, what all cultures mean. How many cultures are there in America? Thousands, probably. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. Uh, Christine? My thought was that was the where it is relevant to the subject matter would help narrow that down. So where it's appropriate and relevant um, to the discussion, making sure that you include the cultures. But I understand all to be exhaustive. Or I guess you could put people of many, multiple. Relevant, something like that. Right, so the beginning of that sentence was where it is relevant to the subject matter. I thought that that would allow people to narrow it down where, where it's relevant. Th thank you, Christine. Oh, sorry, I was looking down. I was thinking, um, Katie, did you, you're off mute. Did you go first? How about Lisa? Sorry, no, I'm just off okay. mute. It's Lisa. I wasn't looking. Lisa, please. Um, I think um, two comments I would have. One, I think that that's probably more significant of a change than um, I would say fits in the friendly amendment. But I would, I would suggest that perhaps, um, you know, I think that um, Christine has some good suggestions here. But I would suggest that we, if, if we like those suggestions, we ought maybe to table them and have the policy reviewed again by our attorney just to make sure that um, there aren't any because words make a big difference sometimes legally. And I just don't know that any of us have the um, legal expertise to make sure that we are um, safely 
including everyone and protecting the district in the way that we would want to do so. Um, thank you, Lisa. Katie? I, I would agree to take that. Um, my thought is that our policy is not a philosophical document. It's more of um, it, it's legally binding in our, our legal document for protection for the district and for our families and students and teachers. So I if we are going to make that um, significant of a change, we could certainly, I would agree with Lisa, we could table it and um, work it at our next study session or at another uh, another meeting and then also put it past our lawyers. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Christine. I'm fine with that. I wasn't sure what would constitute a friendly amendment, so I just thought I'd put it out there. Um, thank you, Christine. So we have um, I just need a little help uh, procedurally. So we have a motion on the table that has been seconded uh, and now a um, an idea, a uh, friendly amendment and uh, an idea to table this. So do we vote it down or is the table the motion? Table is the prevailing motion. You have to okay. deal with that first. Okay, so uh, it has been. So, so I move to table this uh, policy. Okay. Table, it, the, it's been moved to table uh, policy 604, inclusive education, so we can review uh, Christine's amendment in definition, uh, section three, definitions A. Um, do I have a second? Uh, Mike, uh, I will say Mike. Okay. Great, any comments or questions on that? Yes, John. Yeah, yeah so thank you, Christine. I always appreciate you taking yet another look on these. Supportive of her um, commentary, but also think it's prudent that we do get it in front of a legal uh, eyes. So thank you, Christine. Thank you, John. Any other questions or comments? Echo that. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate it. Um, and so let's move to a roll call vote. Okay. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. aye. Board member Becker. Aye. aye. Board member Holcomb. Aye. aye. Board member Lesage. Aye. aye. Board Member Ritchie? Aye. Board Member Vitale? Aye. Board Member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. Okay, um, with uh, seven ayes, we uh, approve the motion to table policy 604, and we will bring it back um, either at the next study session, um, uh, probably the next study session. Great, thank you. Uh, moving to our next policy, uh, policy 606, instructional material review, selection, and use. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, as I've said, each time this topic's come up, this uh, policy has received a lot of attention by the board over the years. Uh, the new uh, proposal uh, includes a lot of language from the uh, model policy uh, from the MSBA and you've had some other input uh, during the uh, hearings that you've had and the, and the board meetings. Uh, it's presented tonight because you felt it was ready to be adopted and I would recommend that you adopt it. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, can I have a motion to approve policy 606, instructional material review, selection, and use? Uh, Mark, uh, can I have a second? Mike. Great. Um, uh, comments or questions? Um, seeing none, uh, we move to a roll call vote. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. aye. Board member Vitale? Aye. aye. Board member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. With seven ayes, the motion carries. Our last policy, um, goal two related policy, is policy 607, controversial topics and materials. Um, Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, this is a relatively uh, short policy, but it's an important one. Uh, controversial topics and materials and how they're handled. Um, I think the uh, direction you've had from this policy over time of uh, making sure that controversial topics are uh, treated with fairness and balance and that you uh, 
uh, you know, I would certainly recommend that you avoid trying to restrict those uh, to in any way because uh, our administrators are able to work with teachers on how to balance that and uh, make sure that various points of view are heard. And I think in this uh, time of, uh, you know, great turmoil in our country where there are lots of opinions on everything that uh, we deal with, um, to shut out uh, the voices of someone who feels like a matter is controversial uh, would be a, uh, you know, a serious uh, diversion of, on the path of excellence that you've had. So uh, you felt that this policy was ready to be adopted, and I would recommend that you adopt it. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, can I get a motion to approve policy 607, controversial topics and materials as presented? Katie, is there a second? John, thank you. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, um, let's move to a roll call vote. Okay. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. aye. Board member Becker. Aye. aye. Board member Holcomb. Aye. aye. Board member Lesage. Aye. Board member Ritchie. Aye. Board member Vitali. Aye. Board member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. With seven ayes, the motion carries. Great. Um, we will bring uh, 604 back at the next study session. Um, on the rest of them, I just want to echo um, what was said before. Thank you to the administrators and staff that worked on this, uh, as well as the community and schools. Um, a lot of work went into this, and I think we made some great uh, changes that move these policies forward, uh, modernize them, and uh, uh, I think it's great to support our goal to work. So thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, our next agenda item is the adoption of the learning model. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, this is, there are a lot of moving parts in uh, all of these plans and planning as we get more guidance from the state. Uh, we actually had our meeting with the uh, uh, guiding, kind of the guiding committee for Hennepin County School Districts at our last, uh, uh, covering the plan that you had discussed uh, on the 17th of, uh, of December. And uh, they gave us the green light to move ahead with the plan. So some of the uh, changes that I've made in that in the last day reflect what we got back from them. Uh, in other words, some of the uh, uh, what ifs uh, aren't what ifs any longer. We'll be able to uh, uh, move ahead with the uh, plan pretty much as, as was described. And, and uh, for the audience, the plan was basically approved by the board on the 17th of December, but because the board does not legally act on uh, motions at a study session, it's brought back tonight and uh, there's some improvements to it. So we'll, we'll cover that. So I'm going to uh, cover several things before we jump into the logistics of the plan. But uh, the main thing I wanted to do is bring the board up to speed on, on the uh, committee, uh, Amy, uh, Ledoux and uh, Annie uh, Lamar Benson also uh, sat in with me on, on that meeting and were helpful to uh, getting uh, answers explained to the committee. Uh, the one issue that we need to get more uh, direction from the state on is whether we're going to be allowed to bring in all four grades of the high school at one time. Um, we know that we cannot bring in more than three grades of elementary at a time, uh, but the state is not clear yet on whether that applies to high schools, especially four-year high schools. I explained to them that, uh, you know, it's pretty clear that with an elementary school, you, your first grade is pretty much your first grade. It doesn't mix with third grade. Uh, third grade is separate, et cetera. But in the high school, you have a mixture of classes where you may have sophomores in with seniors, you might have freshmen in with juniors, et cetera. So uh, if we have to bounce around with three grades starting out at a time and then bring a, a 
fourth one on two weeks later, it will be problematic for us and uh, really make it more difficult to get the balance kind of uh, instruction and the kind of start we want. But they still uh, felt they needed to go back and get an answer on that on that issue for us. Um, they're also going to clarify for us whether or not we can have major uh, national tests during the month of, uh, of uh, January. Right now there's a major test scheduled on the uh, 26th of, uh, of uh, January at the high school. So we'll get clarification on that. But everything else has pretty much been clarified. And uh, we also, uh, as, as they did, had the 14-day uh, trends that we've been using uh, for our decisions. Uh, those come from Hennepin County Health and uh, they're usually given to us on a Tuesday morning. However, the data are often, uh, you know, relatively old, and particularly where the, uh, we're in a dynamic situation with the uh, incidence of COVID either going up or going down rapidly, uh, you know, you don't have really current data when you're relying upon that, but those are, you know, because they're the ones deciding for us how much we can do uh, within the, uh, science of this uh, of this change. Uh, we feel that we need to work with them on the data that they have. But uh, uh, the latest data show that Hennepin County total for the period between the mid-December and the end of December is 30.0 uh, per 10,000 people. So that's down from 130.7 uh, essentially five weeks earlier. So it's coming down rapidly as it went up rapidly. And if you look at uh, some of the cities where we draw our primary uh, student numbers, uh, you've got Eden Prairie at 31.6. You have uh, um, uh, Minnetonka at 30.6. Um, you have St. Louis Park at 31.2. And then the other, the smaller suburban communities around the lake uh, at 31.3. So those are very probably below 30 now, which uh, allows by using the old scale that they started the year with uh, to be used and still have uh, high school students and middle school students in school on a hybrid model. They did not want to take up the uh, final conclusions on our plan to move to in person on the 15th of March. They want to get more numbers and data from us and uh, look at how, how the incidence is going over the, uh, the really the probably four or five weeks of school when we start in, on February 1st. So probably around the 1st of March or maybe the second week of March, they'll give us a green light to either move from hybrid to in person or um, probably uh, uh, the other option would be just the hybrid. So I doubt that we're going to be forced to go back to e-learning uh, anytime soon. That doesn't mean that, that that can't happen, but a lot of things are, are going on in our, uh, you know, in our state to mitigate the growth of, uh, of uh, COVID again without major, major changes. We, we did uh, make the delay in our plan from January 5th, essentially the end of the uh, winter break until two weeks later, uh, the 19th of January. Uh, we left those uh, on e-learning so that we could kind of get by whatever might have happened over the winter break, travel and all of those kinds of things that, that officials were worried about. Uh, so that's the logic behind uh, starting on the 19th. The 18th, of course, is Martin Luther King holiday, so we would be off that day celebrating his birthday. And uh, so those are some uh, important uh, changes. We also have finally gotten most of the uh, high school uh, students to and their parents to tell us which model they want to be on. Um, that took longer than we had thought it would, and we still don't have answers from all of the students. So. Uh, we're, we're at a point now where about 83% of the high school students will be uh, on hybrid, which is a low enough number that we can get all of the 
uh, half, half, I shouldn't say all of half, so we get half of the students in one day and half another day at the high school. Uh, we were worried that if it got up to more like 90% wanting to be at school on the hybrid, we might not have room enough to accommodate that. But with it being uh, 80 to 83%, uh, of the students wanting to be on hybrid, uh, we're confident now that we can go ahead with the proposal to uh, have uh, essentially what we're doing with middle school. So high school would have half the students on maybe Monday and Tuesday, the other half on Thursday and Friday, and Wednesdays uh, we would have to meet the state's requirement for additional planning time for teachers and we would have our mass program on uh, Wednesdays, more uh, specific help. And then there could be uh, other uses of the building if we wanted to, uh, to do that. So that's, uh, those are all kind of secured now with the decisions that have been made and uh, how, how they've been communicated to us. The other uh, changes that we felt we needed to make were to, uh, we, had, we had proposed to you on the 17th of December that uh, grades four and five uh, not move out of the high school until uh, after the 27th of, uh, of uh, uh, January. We think that it would be a smoother transition for them as well as the high school teachers if instead of having three days of hybrid and one day of e-learning during the week of the 18th of uh, January, that we have Martin Luther King holiday, and then four days of hybrid uh, instruction at the high school for students in grades four and five. So that's really the model they were in when they left uh, in, uh, at the end of November. And so they're returning to that and uh, we'll start up with that and then uh, the end of that week of course is January 22nd so at, uh, at the end of the day on January 22nd we would essentially be done having uh, elementary children at the high school um, so um, that would give uh, really nine days for, high, uh, for those fourth and fifth grade teachers to kind of vacate the, the high school although we would like to get them move back to the elementary schools much quicker than that. And uh, if they'll uh, work with us, we'll uh, have just pick up the boxes and all that they have, and all they have to do is move themselves and any personal items back to their elementary school for the week of January 5th, or 25th, excuse me, for January 25th. So January 25th is a grading and reporting day, uh, so our, and planning day. Uh, that's in the calendar, so all of our teachers will be on that, including e-learning teachers. And uh, then uh, we'll have two days of e-learning for fourth and fifth grade. Uh, their teachers can either be at their own elementary schools or from home, or wherever they choose to uh, teach their e-learning uh, students. And uh, we'll leave that up to each individual teacher. And so really, uh, we'll be able to have high school uh, teachers uh, get ready for the opening of high school on the hybrid on the uh, 28th of, uh, which is a Thursday, the 28th of January. So they'll have uh, uh, that weekend, they'll have the, the uh, planning and uh, grading and planning day, and then they'll have two more days of planning for getting the high school open again. So that'll be a fairly major change for them. All their students and the teachers have been on e-learning for the most part all fall. And uh, so they need that kind of time uh, to get ready. We'll also have uh, time on uh, January 28th and 29th for uh, elementary teachers, including the e-learning teachers to uh, do their planning for uh, starting on uh, February 1st. So I know there are no changes for e-learning students, but there will be some changes in the uh, class lists and so forth as some of their e-learning students decide to come back for the in-person instruction. So uh, not to bounce around here too much, but I want to kind of complete some of those changes that have been made. So rolling back to 
uh, the start of uh, instruction in person again, and not using the term in person, but more meaning we'll have kids with teachers and the hybrid model at the elementary schools. We'll have K through two at each of their elementary schools starting on January 19th. They'll be in what we've called the hybrid model up to, up to this point, although uh, we use some of the uh, uh, protocols and all of hybrid you know, they're still in school every day and uh, taking instruction every day that, uh, that week. And uh, so that will be the week of the 19th. We're also, as I just said, going to have grades four and five also on hybrid during that uh, week. We can bring in four and five because they're in a separate school. They're not in the same schools as grades K through two. We are still stuck with the conclusion from the uh, state that we, they don't want us bringing it into a school more than three grades at a time, uh, even though we just had more than three grades at a time in our elementary schools six weeks ago. Uh, the rules are, are new and uh, we want to certainly uh, work with the state on, on their expectations. So, uh, and, and also, you know, for people wondering why don't we just go into in person right away uh, on January 19th. We wanted to ease into that. So we're taking some time for the two weeks after the break and then two more weeks to kind of make sure that we're getting things settled into place with, uh, with uh, K through two in the schools. And then uh, after a two week period, we can bring in uh, the third graders. So third graders will be on e-learning during that uh, entire two week period. And uh, at the same time, we can bring fourth and fifth graders back to the elementary schools. So uh, we're still leaving ourselves a little room in the uh, plan that if uh, numbers change or something goes haywire uh, and we're not allowed to bring high school kids in on the day we are now believing we can, uh, that we would still probably leave fourth and fifth graders there longer. Uh, those are fluid situations that we can certainly work with. And it's no, by no means intended to be a lack of confidence that we're going to bring in high school students on the 28th of uh, January. We, we believe that's going to happen, but there can always be, uh, you know, things happen with this tricky virus. Uh, but right now, um, our numbers are certainly supporting uh, coming in hybrid for secondary schools. So. Um, that's kind of the picture on elementary, how those will, that'll all work. Uh, as I said, third graders will join everybody else on uh, February 1st. And everyone in the elementary at that point will be on in-person or so-called in-person, uh, where uh, we'll have larger numbers in our classroom, uh, basically the numbers that we would have had had we not had, uh, had uh, to uh, develop pods and and all of the other things that we've done through the uh, state's requirements to uh, get school open. So um, essentially that's how uh, school will look. Uh, there will be some uh, uh, new protocols required. Uh, there's gonna be, we have to have testing readily available for our staff uh, uh, when we start uh, in person on the 1st of February. Uh, we thought we were going to have a requirement that teachers wear not only masks, as you have in your policy, but also shields. And now they backed off of that requirement. And so that's gonna be up to districts to decide if they wanna require shields as well as uh, masks for their adult population in, uh, in the in-person model. So if we, uh, We'll, we'll, we'll come back and talk to you again probably on the uh, study session on the 21st and then you still would have time to make a decision uh, to either require the shields or make them optional. I think it's, a, it's an issue that's going to be thoroughly discussed by staff as to, you know, um, I may be fine not wearing a mask, but if you're not wearing one, you know, I feel unsafe with that. So there'll be a lot of dialogue among staff as to whether we should all wear uh, shields as well as, as well as masks to, uh, to make that work. Uh, 
We'll still have the mask requirements and all at the high school and the middle school. We'll have the six foot uh, distancing requirement uh, met at the high school and middle school until we go on to in-person learning there. Um, and then of course vaccine. Uh, I know there are a lot of questions about when are we gonna get vaccine. I sat in on a meeting for an hour this morning or an hour and a half and I think I heard five different opinions of when we're going to get vaccines. So, <laughs> uh, and everybody was sure of their source. So uh, all I left that meeting uh, knowing is that we don't know yet. Some believe that we're just about around the corner to start vaccinating teachers. And that in fact, in some counties, they're ready to start vaccinating some teachers. That has not come out of Hennepin County yet. But certainly, uh, by the 1st of February, there's a good likelihood that a lot of teachers will start to be able to get uh, vaccinated, and, and not just teachers, but other adults working in our schools who uh, need to be in close contact with each other and uh, with, uh, with children. And then, of course, we'll get more insight as to the vaccination schedule availability for children and, and youth in our schools. My guess would be that they would want to, high school age students to get vaccinated before younger kids because of the, you know, the science around how, how much spread there is from those respective groups. But, you know, those are decisions that are being made at the state level. Um, we've got some uh, planning days scheduled and uh, those have not changed from the plan. So uh, basically we'll have uh, elementary uh, teachers planning on the, uh, uh, 28th and 29th to get their final conclusions made for moving to in-person. Although there's not much of a change there, there will be more children uh, in their classrooms. Uh, there'll be a limited number of students who have to be on a different, uh, on a different class. And uh, we thought that there would be almost no change there. But we had some class sizes that were not going to be comfortable for students and teachers. So we're uh, going to have to hire a handful of teachers to make sure that we don't have uh, second graders in classes of 30 and things like that. So uh, we're, we're taking care of that. So we'll, we'll be in good shape with class sizes throughout the elementary schools. Generally, they'll actually be smaller than we would have had had we not uh, had the requirements to deal with the pandemic. And then of course, high school teachers will be um, doing their planning to go into hybrid on the uh, uh, 26th and 27th. That's a Tuesday and a Wednesday. As I've already said, the 25th is already a built-in day of, of uh, grading and so forth. So the high school teachers uh, will be ready to uh, start high school students on the 28th, and uh, they'll have half of the student body then and half on the uh, Friday the 29th. So um, I've, uh, the, the changes in the uh, document that is being reflected on the screen uh, are, uh, if they're underlined, that's an additional uh, statement that's been added to the uh, document. If it's crossed out, it's a, a statement that's, that's been deleted. Uh, the board all has uh, copies, hard copies, as well as the visual here uh, to look at. Uh, on those changes. So I don't think I need to go through any more of the changes. I've kind of incorporated them in my uh, explanation. But, um, you know, as, uh, you know, in, involved as I am in all of these uh, dates and times, there may be things I've skipped over here that you'd like to know more about. So I'd be happy to answer questions board members have. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, as you talked about uh, at the beginning, um, uh, in our original adoption of the um, reopening plan, uh, the learning model, um, we have um, given you the, the authority to, uh, to communicate the, uh, the specific changes of the learning model, um, uh, but we also wanted the ability to adopt those changes. So um, Andy, can I have um, the grid up, please? Um, so, um, if people have questions, 
um, we can respond to Dr. Peterson. Um, otherwise, we can move to a motion, I believe. So let's do that. Um, uh, so can I have a motion to approve the learning model as presented? Mark, uh, is there a second? Katie, um, thank you. Um, any comments or questions? Christine. Um, thank you, Dr. Peterson, for that in-depth overview. I had a number of questions and, and you got most of them. Um, I did have two questions. You had talked about the vaccinations for the teachers and how nobody's really sure when they're gonna be available. Do we plan on offering a vaccination clinic similar to like a flu clinic once we do have more information on that? We have limited information. Um, we, we got some additional details today. Uh, but we expect to get more information uh, soon. So I think they're going to uh, try to set up some clinics in schools and uh, different counties are proceeding differently. So it's, uh, uh, you know, some are already starting those clinics and, uh, you know, head of a county hasn't gotten that direction finalized yet. So we'll certainly keep the board uh, informed about that as well as our community. Christine, did you have other questions? I did, and um, I've been, my connectivity was um, Christine, you are cutting out. Uh, um, and the second question I have is. Go ahead, I heard, we heard second question now. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, second question is, um, okay, once the kids return to school in person, and I'm, I'm sure the answer is yes, but will masks be required by the students? Yes, Matt, you, you have a policy that uh, until it's uh, repealed, will require masks of all uh, adults and students in school, and that will be good practice okay. as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Lisa. Um, thanks, Dr. Peterson, for all the detailed information. And I know that um, you and all of our administrators and, uh, and other staff are working really hard to iron out all of the details um, you know, that, that aren't on here, although there are a lot of details already established, but I know there will be many more as we kind of work through the specifics of each situation and each move and, and all of that. I know it's a lot like a, you know, there's a lot to um, take care of. You, you mentioned that you've been in some meetings. I'm wondering, um, is there any additional um, insight that you have into upcoming changes that we might expect to hear more about? in regards to school and the governor's learning plan? I don't think so at this point. Uh, you know, I, I think things are gonna keep changing. There's still details that are not clear. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, I was on that meeting this morning with several other administrators from around the Metro and uh, you know, they all have, you know, different versions of things. So they're hoping to get more clarity on some things and we'll share that with the board and the community. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Mike. Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, all the details, Dr. Pearson. And, and, you know, we know from our study session, we went over um, a lot of this discussion I know with, with the administration you're working, there's a, there's a lot of different uh, pieces of the puzzle you know, that need to, to fit together to make this happen. Um, we know that obviously students with their teachers in the classroom with all the appropriate safety protocols in place are, are what's best for, for everyone. So, um, you know, I, hopefully again, I know we've been, you know, for our communities, um, so just for their knowledge, you know, we, we have been um, working daily you know, with the Department of Health and, and articulating how, you know, we're addressing various, you know, situations within our schools. 
so hopefully again with uh, with any luck and if the cases if, you know if it if it stays here and continues to trend down some you know we'll prove that we've earned the right uh, to have all the high schoolers back you know in the high school on march 15th so i know it's uh um all the pieces need to fit together but you know and i know and i do think we've got a lot of you know comments back from community members and stuff too and, and they understand the challenges you know we, we've been working through um but i guess it's also just a, a request too to, to for some patients it's been trying for all of us but uh um because i know you and your team have been putting in exhaust exhaustive hours as well as the teachers you know doing the best we can with the, during this challenging pandemic to uh to deliver the best quality of education to students as we can, but um, but yeah, we're all looking forward to uh, to this plan and rolling it out. And, and again, fingers crossed that uh, the cases continue to come down and and uh, we'll be in p good position. Because I know also discussing uh, with with friends that have students in other districts, I commend you and, and your team on the communication because um, we had a plan. You know, right after the governor's plan was rolled out. We acted quickly and many other districts it, it was like almost like you're starting from square one going through different scenarios so we had scenarios that we were that you presented to us and we worked through that so um again appreciate all the efforts and and look forward to uh, to rolling this out thank you thank you mike I appreciate that um th th that comment any other questions or comments um, Dr. Pearson, just quickly, um, the the planning days for K through five, correct? Those will be January twenty eighth and 29th? Correct. So yeah. students will be off so for for right. from everything. Right. And then the high school will get their two planning days. Is it the 26th and 27th? Right. Yes. Okay. And since the middle school is not changing models, right. then they will start back on January 26th. That's correct. I, I, I don't think I really described much about the middle school because they're just okay. coming back on the 26th and, yep. you know, doing what they've been doing. Per perfect. I, I think those are, uh, obviously, there's some details of when the fourth or fifth graders are going to be in, but I think those are are very key dates for, yep. for a big population of the, the district. So thank you for um, clarifying that, making sure I was correct. Okay, any other questions or comments? Oh, Christine. Sorry, sorry this, this, this kind of goes off yours to make sure I understand. So is it, sorry, what days are the planning days, the 28th and 29th? For K through five. Or K through five? The, um, the high school days are the 26th and 27th. Okay, so there's not two days that every grade has off that week. Is that correct? That's correct. Nope. Everybody's in school different. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. The middle school will have a lot of planning to do when they get ready to move to in person. Yes. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, I forget now. Did we have? We did have a motion. Thank you. Um, uh, seeing no more questions or comments, uh, we can move to a roll call vote. Board members, when I call your name, in favor, please say aye. Board member Rosen. Aye. Board member Becker. Aye. Board member Holcomb. Aye. Board member Lesage. Aye. Board member Ritchie. Aye. Board member Vitali. Aye. Board member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. Thank um, you, board members. With seven eyes, uh, the motion carries. Uh, w one a comment, I just want to echo um, everybody's thanks to the administrators, especially um, you pointed out Ms. Ledoux, who is in the office, and Ms. Lombard Benson uh, as well. So thank you from the board as well as all the administrators and you, Dr. Peterson. Thank you. Um, thank, we, we really appreciate it. Okay, our uh, next agenda item is uh, the approval of the Momentum Building Project. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, at the uh, last meeting, we had a very good discussion about the proposed uh, building uh, that would be constructed uh, on and attached to the Pagel Center. It has really nothing to do with the Pagel Center, but it has to be attached to a, a, a building in order to qualify under the law for the funds that you're using. So it will be very well uh, uh, positioned across 
the uh, driveway at the uh, uh, essentially the south side of the uh, high school and between between the high school building itself and uh, the Pagel Center and it will provide a valuable space for our momentum program which is growing very rapidly and has uh, had a lot of great support from the board. You had some additional questions at that time and so I've asked uh, Principal Erickson to come and uh, provide some answers. I think he may have a PowerPoint to use to uh, give you those details. So Mr. Erickson, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, Mr. Chair. Uh, great to be back and to share uh, some information that we found in our work in really the uh, past few weeks, but then all along in the, in the process. So I'm happy to walk through the details with you and what we found and to specifically address some of the questions that came up the last time. As a kickoff, share all the different program options that we have, and we're getting ready for registration just in a few weeks. And tonight, again, focusing on the Momentum program, as Dr. Peterson mentioned, uh, the, the new strand that started this year, the Home Renovation and Physics strand, and then looking at to future courses that were approved at previous meetings. I think I just want to start by just reminding how we've, over the past, really, eight to ten years, looked at space at the high school in recognizing that some of the unique programs that we have require different space. It was about six years ago that we uh, went through the process for Minnetonka Research in really identifying and visiting schools and seeing what's out there to figure out that we just can't put this program in a traditional lab. It needs to look different. So really making sure that the space that we have in the high school fits the program needs. And I think that is a significant change over my time is that just have a traditional classroom, you just move in and the furniture is there and you don't worry about it versus being really intentional that the space dictates how learning happens and how engagement happens and how students collaborate. You look at the right, of course, the, the loft project was another piece of turning once we're locker rooms into really highly collaborative space. Uh, that space we're looking at now uh, holds AP computer science and we all the research about how the facility needs to work for students to do that. So when we think of the momentum program, think about that idea of how is the space we're creating allow these programs to really take off and to really work for students to be functional. And then also, a phrase I'll come back to in a few minutes, just thinking of the future. We don't know as we look at the space momentum what we'll be doing in five years, 10 years. So making sure that we future-proof the space that we're creating so as things come down the line, uh, we'll be able to really accommodate that. So again, the three areas I want to come back to uh, from based on the questions is update on the experience from physics, home renovation, our research, and our partnerships that we're looking at within the program. So the, right now, um, as we look at our space within the high school for, um, we have a metals lab and we have a woods lab. And you can see these are the courses that currently exist within those spaces. Uh, metal sculpture is a new class that was added as part of the momentum program as well. Uh, but if you notice off to the right, uh, we have an issue with the space currently for the, mo for the program of home renovation physics. Uh, we have uh, two sections of that course. Uh, that's a two-hour course, so again, it would use four of the six periods to operate. So you notice it doesn't have a home right now uh, within that. And so uh, we've, had, we've made it work this fall uh, based on our e-learning plan, but even when we had Skipper Wednesdays and hybrid, we were able to get the students in and really uh, make that work. But there's, there's not a space uh, designated to do that. Prior to this fall, we were planning to share space, even use a theater. Uh, stage, uh, facility, our, um, uh, shop to accommodate some of the needs for the program. So we really tried to uh, shoehorn in in different spots, but it really is a, a struggle. So if we look at how might we use uh, the space within the program, the auto lab, we anticipate that we would have uh, of 21, 22 second semester, could be one, two courses. Um, it's hard to know how many we'll sign up for right away. I would point when we started momentum in the home renovation physics strand, we had 80 students. And that is stronger than any program that we've started for its first year, to have that number of students in it. So uh, we would be able to move the power and energy class that's currently within the main campus, and then using flexible lab space, we'd have three periods that it could be open, but it could be two. As we look to the fall of 21, or 22, 23, uh, then uh, looking at the fact of adding automotive two, and then also the partnership and having some of the courses be concurrent enrollment classes. Again, we send students right now to Southwest to have that automotive class, and that would no longer happen. It would all happen within our campus. 
So just to give some more details of the programmatic needs and what will be happening within this space is home renovation. You know, these are all the objectives that we have within this program and how this space would allow us to, in the roles of architects, engineers, describing you're working as a team member, communication, uh, OSHA, and the requirements, students would, re would receive the OSHA certification, um, blueprints, all the methodology for frame floors, walls, ceilings, roofs, all residential construction. So those are all the things that students have been working on, and again, needing the space to have that happen. And that space looks different. The, the things are hauling in to build a small house are very different than if you're building a birdhouse. So uh, what are the things that we're able to do? Uh, again, major projects that we've done so far, the framing projects, painting, restoration, pro residential shed, OSHA certification, I shared with you in the last uh, meetings related to the work with Habitat. So there's several different projects, probably the most significant that how this space would facilitate learning would be the, the small house and shed. Again, those doors need to be different uh, and space needs to be different to accommodate that. Within this space that is proposed, there would be a classroom uh, option. So as you look at the idea of, even with our Minnetonka research, we have the classroom space where the students are working and then they go through uh, the glass doors into the research part. And so that there is ability for both things to happen. You know, right now they're going between two different rooms and they're not connected. This would allow really the flow from students back and forth uh, to have that happen. So uh, this is a rigorous option for students. They're receiving their science credit through this and they're also uh, receiving the home renovation class. So two pieces, all the physics standards that they have are part of the course and they're interconnected. So that space of having the rooms right next to each other would really facilitate the learning. You know, looking ahead for second semester, uh, you know, the potential units they've got going on, they're working with electricity, different types, solar, radon heat, light, sound, uh, continuation of their projects with Habitat for Humanity, uh, projects that I've mentioned. Uh, eight years ago when we started Vantage, uh, we looked at the idea of guest instructors and mentors, and I'll talk about that mentor piece tonight with you, what we're looking at for second semester for students in the Momentum program. But that frame really helps us uh, look at this program where they have guest instructors. We've had a number of guest instructors. And really with the e-learning part or the Google Meet, we can get people that we might not normally be able to get at a quicker rate because they can just hop onto their meeting uh, with that. So uh, those are some things that we're looking ahead. One of the questions that came up last time is what will, the, what will that mentor experience look like? So students uh, will have that mentor uh, opportunity a second semester. So Momentum has all of the components that we really looked at that have engagement, the guest instructor, the mentors, the instructors, business projects, site visits. Uh, so all those components happen uh, within this program. So second semester, uh, students will have that mentor opportunity within the, the Momentum program. Again, taking from uh, that connection to really confidence and their ability to interact with adults, uh, the, we've learned with our research program, we've learned with Vantage, that mentor is a critical part of that experience. And we've learned so far that students hold on to that mentor relationship well beyond their time at the school. So answering your questions about programs, uh, that gives you a sense of the curriculum. It also gives you a sense of the question related to mentors. Uh, there's a, an elaborate, which I won't go through all the details on the slide, but there's an elaborate process of mentoring. It's not just, hey, good luck, say hello to your mentor. It's very intentionally laid out of what each meeting looks like and developing those soft skills uh, that students have. Some of the questions related to research and what we've found uh, so far, uh, as we look at the space, because obviously we're making an investment in space, we wanna make sure that we, uh, we have the things that we need. Uh, the need for new classrooms, the learning space, that idea of maker space. I mentioned the fact that it's, you know, having a classroom next to the the, the area where they would have the equipment is really critical. I'm not talking bringing in huge pieces of machinery. It really it has to be very flexible and mobile. Uh, community partnerships, I'll share with you in a few minutes some of the, the connections we've made so far. There are a lot of things we have to think about that I don't generally plan on within the buildings, like what we do with oil, fluids, tires, cars, wood, all those, making sure we have all those facilities and where it's located will allow that to happen. Again, equipment needs, um, you know, this is not obviously in the high school, so we aren't necessarily gonna have uh, sound or smell issues, but those are all factors as we look at building it. 
Uh, feedback from all the research, two of everything, flexible stir, uh, furniture and storage. Um, we've talked about things being very mobile, and as I said, future pr uh, proof. Outside to outside is really critical. One of the highlights of this location on campus is, is obviously uh, allows us great access. The, ro the frontage, or the road in the back, and being able to get things in and out very easily. That is really critical as we talk to other schools, making sure that, that it is there. I've seen some schools where, uh, in Indiana that the, it's right in the actual building. Again, that presents different uh, challenges. Uh, Eight students, you know, tool belts, materials, things that they need, auto space for cleanup, um, giving students really a practical feel uh, in a really professional environment. And as I mentioned, all the space and things we've learned is making sure that we future-proof it uh, and that learning environment will change and really making it as functional and flexible as possible. Uh, we've had a chance to connect and do a site visit to Burnsville to look at all the different parts. You can get a sense in the picture. This is a recent site visit. You know, the uh, uh, square to the, the top row, you can see this one over, the second one over, you see all the storage materials, the classroom space, all the different auto uh, equipment that's needed. I mean, this is heavily used equipment and space by the students. Uh, when we had all of our preliminary conversations, I'll show you a slide of the places that we've talked with since our last conversation. Uh, obviously, the winter break is not the most ideal time to reaching out to everyone, but we did have a contact with many different local car companies, repair, and there's a high level of interest. And you look at the bottom right-hander corner here with Walzer Learning Center, I mean, that's on the campus. I mean, so businesses see a strong need to develop a partnership and a pipeline of employees to uh, to have them be part of their business. So they're very eager. Uh, Burnsville did not have issues with finding people to be involved with that. So this gives you a sense of really our team uh, being able, and they have really, I mean, I'm sharing the work that they have done and shared with me in planning, but they have done a lot of the legwork to really find out what's working and what are things that we need to make sure that we have to make sure the space is functional. And this is just all the different details that we learned from Burnsville about the space that we need, um, small engine, courses that they offer, advanced vehicle repair, internships. Again, that two classroom need is really critical. So you have the workspace, which we would have for automotive, plus the classroom. Storage space is critical. Um, this is all about application of learning. You know, every, the research program we have, the Vantage program we have, the momentum, it's taking the content and applying it in real world scenarios. You see in the middle of the column, uh, again, feedback from Burns will be aware of sounds and smells. That's a repeating theme. Uh, Auto internship is a, is a critical part. Um, program administration, we really learned like, what are things that they have found in terms of grant. You can see the, some of the specific data uh, that they have been able to receive from, from Walzer, for example. Uh, they've had a director of partnerships to help with this, a builders association. Uh, there's just a high level of interest in, from outside groups to be part of that. So these are all the things they have found so far uh, in their space. Uh, parking, office space, uh, all the different program needs. Again, all the vitals, all the space issues that we've learned from them, lifts, tire machine, ventilation, health and safety, cleaning. So we've really done the research to see what, what needs to be on site to make it work. So as we look to the program, obviously we don't have this current space at the high school. Post visit, what did the staff find? Again, classrooms, partnerships, and just some of the things that we don't normally plan on that we're looking at in terms of uh, fluids and cars and, and uh, storage spots for that. Just briefly, Nebraska was another place that we looked at to see what they have done. Um, again, uh, collaborating with their local community college to look at dual credit. So when we talk about uh, all of our classes within the Momentum program, we've, uh, that is our next step to see with every course, how can we have concurrent enrollment? and uh, how can we make sure students are able to have that opportunity. So that is a piece specifically re related to the automotive. Uh, college and career readiness in the middle column, applying their material, the mentoring experience. So in the Nebraska model, again, that mentor part that we're starting second semester, uh, that 100 business organizations involved. Um, again, the, the equipment that the staff need uh, is practical and helps really need to help staff with the professional training to use all the the equipment that we want to have. This just gives you a sense of the school in Nebraska and the space. So as we've looked and compared different models, you can see clearly what, what other schools have done, and it really aligns with what we're looking at in terms of the proposal. 
Uh, Egan High School is work that we did this summer. Again, some of the same pieces. We learned that OSHA, is a, OSHA certification, that's something our students will have, is critical. Um, again, you see the applied learning that the work is done outside all year. So that's still part of it. Um, of, we do have some space around where that could take place. Um, giving exposure to as many aspects for the trades, uh, physical, the saws and need to be physically close. The, the material, if we're gonna do something, for example, on the patio outside the cafeteria, that's in close proximity uh, to the, where this uh, momentum building would be. And just all of the questions that we've had to think about um, really shows the need to have something not necessarily part of the current campus, having something that is where this location would be to have the equipment, um, storing all the things that just take much more space. Space uh, right now within our current spaces is challenging for just simply storage. Um, similar things that we learned from Egan, uh, having enough equipment. You can see some of the pieces that, uh, that they said that they needed. Um, again, access to outside is critical. So as we look to make sure the space we have fits for that, that would happen, trailer and storage. Um, so some significant planning to make sure we can have all the pieces. A lot of information from Bonfi, they've been a partner with us, uh, also part of our advisory board. So similar to our other programs, we have an outside adv advisory board that has really given us feedback along the way about things that they need to have. So you can, you know, the, I go to the back, the bottom line is simple, open, accessible. It's feedback that the outside experts have provided that we need to look at our space and we have that in our design so that it is uh, meeting all of those pieces. Uh, Ted Beckman and uh, Marley Gartner are also part of RJM Construction, part of our advisory board. I just would come back to the bottom three bullets on this slide, just the future proof, the space. So when you look at the, the, the space, we can move things around quickly, multi-purpose, multi-use. I would anticipate the space being used after school, weekends, you know, this, that maker space could be used by robotics, could be used by other groups, uh, clubs that uh, would, have, would have a use for it. Partnerships uh, was one of the last questions of how we can work. Um, we, over the years, have found with Vantage, you know, we have projects every single year for all of our strands and some pretty amazing uh, partnerships. We have the same opportunity within our Minnetonka research, and that's not any different, we found so far, as our work with Momentum. Students have had partnership experiences so far, but as we look at automotive, um, you know, these are some of the, the external participants as part of our advisory board that have guided us. They've been a critical part of our partnerships. We have an alumni, the, the second or third, uh, second bullet, Henry Paris, he's been a guest instructor. So as we, as people ask, you know, who's been guiding us along the way in development of the program and the needs, uh, we really relied on the advisory board. And these are the different uh, contacts we've had since the last board meeting of who would like to have further conversation and help engage with us. So those are all the different uh, car dealers and other businesses as we've approached them in the past few weeks to say, this is what we're working on. Are you willing to engage with us in conversation? And, and preliminary say, yes, we're excited to, to engage and to work further. So uh, we always come back to our profile of a graduate and we look here of the the third bullet, which is outside mentor in the area of passion, that's something that happens within this. Uh, there's high levels of engagement, the Minnetonka Instructional Framework, all the elements are embedded within this program of uh, collaboration, critical thinking, communication, uh, and a rigorous experience in the classes that they're taking. So I've gone a little over, I've tried to come back to the questions. We're really excited about this opportunity. I think it fulfills our hope of having a place for every student and having the space to run the programs that we want to offer for our students now and in the future. Great, thank you, Principal Erickson. Uh, Andy, can I have the, the grid view back up? Um, as uh, Dr. Peterson pointed out, um, we had talked at the study session um, about the financing pieces of this. Um, uh, we went over the space, uh, it, 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 um, and we wanted it to come back to talk about um, some of the programming and partnerships. Um, a, a few board members had, had concerns with that. So um, uh, with that, I think um, we can move forward. Um, can I get a motion uh, to approve the construction of the Mose Momentum Design and Skills Trade Addition to the Pago Center for completion by December 31st, 2021 for use in the second semester of fiscal year 2020? 
2022. Oh, 2022. Thank you. Uh, John, and uh, can I have a second? Is Mike? Any comments or questions? I would point out that Paul is also available for questions here. Okay. Uh, John. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mr. Erickson, thank you very much for all the work you did to help us really understand how we connect, you know, and for those of you who haven't been on this journey, we started with jobs of the future, right? Where are the jobs of the future and how do we actually think about building our curriculum to help our students need those future jobs and where the market's going. Um, secondly, as we combine that with the Minnetonka framework, as you well know, to say, how do we actually use those hands-on applied learnings to drive a differentiated learning experience for our students? Um, to your credit, we, we started with the students and say, is this even an interest, right? Just because there's a need to connect that student interest and the, the workshops um, and the, the forums you held to see, is there is there really an interest of our student body um, to, to go after these trades type projects? And obviously from what you've shown from the uh, initial enrollment uh, has been at or above uh, expectations, which has been fantastic. And the feedback from the students has been great. The, the question I had is, as we were going through this, um, the previous board meetings was the funding proposal wasn't all that different from what we've spent on other similar initiatives. So, you know, the research lab was around $4 million. The Vantage we've invested, you know, close to that. So this is falls in range where we have the ability to meet a student need um, that otherwise wouldn't be served by kids sitting in the classroom. So I felt fully supportive of that. The piece that was missing for me was, how are you gonna take that, that future opportunity and connect it through a curriculum and then to the space to fulfill the students' needs. And I really feel like the research that you've done, the learnings that you've obtained really helps me get a better sense of confidence that you've got enough information about how the curriculum is going to perform to help those students meet their learning objectives. That's going to justify how that space is going to be better used than the last time we got together a month ago. So thank you. Thank you, John. Outstanding summary as always. Appreciate it. Um, any other questions or comments? I just want to acknowledge the team the, of teachers that are involved in the Momentum program. It just uh, the work and their commitment to providing these experiences. That's the secret of the high school is amazing staff who work hard to bring these opportunities to students and really thinking beyond our current reality. So I want to acknowledge all the work that the team has put in place. Please thank them from the board. That's a, a great. Um, any other questions or comments? Uh, I see Paul has joined us if we have any questions for him as well. Great, seeing none, let's move to a roll call vote. Board members, if in favor, please say aye, opposed, nay. Board member Ryan Wilson. Aye. Aye. Board member Rebecca. Aye. Aye. Board member Lisa H. Aye. 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 With seven eyes, the motion carries. Super excited. Thank you, Principal thank you Erickson. Everybody. Thank you, board members. Mr. Erickson, thank you. Mr. Bourgeois, thanks for your work. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, our next item is the, appro uh, the approval of purchase of, of building for Minnetonka Transition Program, Transitions Plus. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, we're going to try to get used to not calling it Transition Plus, and I'm working on that. I've called it that for 20 years, so uh, it'll take a little work. But uh, we think it's going to be uh, an exemplary uh, program for those students who have uh, uh, still an opportunity to complete their education in a, in a K-12 district, but they're really beyond that point, and they can be in the program. Is, is it to 22 or to 21? 21. 21. So each state interprets that a little differently. And... Uh, uh, so Christine Breen's going to talk a little bit about uh, how the program will function so much better for our students and uh, how it'll be of value to be in the community and uh, not, not only for the students in the community, but our community will we'll be able to see these students doing great things and uh, building their lives and uh, getting ready to, to do wonderful things on their own. And uh, we have a facility, as I've pointed out to the board, uh, on Highway 7. Uh, it's been leased uh, from the owner for, by Park Nicollet for several years. Uh, it's between the Alaris uh, Bank and uh, the Kinder Care Building. So if you want to kind of see where it is, it's uh, 
a lot of small rooms in it because it was used for a medical clinic. But uh, we'll do some uh, remodeling and we'll use some of the partitions that are already in place. So we'll get into more of the construction part of it after uh, Ms. Breen does her presentation. Christine, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Thank you for having me here this evening to talk about the proposal for our Minnetonka transition program for the fall of 2021. As we feel a strong obligation to serve our students within their home community through the entirety of their educational career, we have been discussing this possibility internally. This is the catalyst for our proposal this evening. Paul Bourgeois will follow with the financial advantages of our own transition program. Special education law mandates services be considered and provided to students through age 21 if needs are identified. Therefore, I'd like to provide a brief overview of the federal and state statutes as they relate to the transition age students. Transition is defined as the process of preparing students for life after high school and includes planning for post-secondary education or training, employment, recreation and leisure, community and independent living. This process is required to be discussed and evaluated prior to the end of a child's ninth grade year. This means that there are specific requirements for an IEP team participation, assessment, creation of measurable post-secondary goals, and links to adult services that might benefit a student. The process involves helping students identify their vision for their future, and it expands the roles of parents and families. Transition programming serves students along a continuum of disabilities. From our most severely disabled, requiring high levels of support to our mildly disabled students who are working toward complete independence. Some students may have higher skills in one area of transition and require support in others. Our transition program will be able to meet the unique needs of our students. An example of how a student's transition support may look in the area of employment is this pyramid outlining scaffolded support and the strive toward independence. As you'll note, beginning at the bottom of the pyramid, we would begin a student at our greenhouse lab at the new transition building. From there, once skills are acquired, students could move to a volunteer position with support at a local greenhouse. Then, our ultimate hope for many students is that they are gainfully employed with one of our amazing local businesses. This example of the continuum of support can be applied to all other areas of transition, post-secondary education, independent living, recreation and leisure, and community. In creating our own transition program, Minnetonka would love to then utilize the robust curriculum review process through the teaching and learning department under the direction of Amy Ledoux and Steve Urbanski as evidence-based curriculum in the area of transition is limited. Minnetonka currently utilizes Project Discovery, which focuses on helping students become job and life ready. In addition to this, we utilize our consultant, Caitlin dornbush fenner a certified behavior analyst to create exceptional programming with regard to transition. Looking forward, we anticipate offering a PAYS lab, which is the Practical Application Exploration Systems, an example of which you see on this slide. We also hope to build out lab spaces in this facility, and we have listed several potential ideas for labs to expand hands-on real-world experiences which has been a Minnetonka priority for many years. We look forward to creating these labs within the new building that focus on student needs and interests, ensuring a wide range of opportunities for students to pursue their hopes and dreams. Our intentions are to create and foster relationships within the Minnetonka community. Students can then engage in practicing public transportation, making appointments in the community, making reservations, or looking for community groups they can join. Additionally, we will look to build strong relationships with our community businesses so that students will build and maintain partnerships that are long-lasting and provide for self-sufficiency and independence. Many of our students remain in our community long after the completion of high school, and we would like to better support our students and families within our community. The purpose of special education is to prepare children to lead productive and independent adult lives to the maximum extent possible. This purpose directly aligns with Minnetonka's mission. 
Minnetonka students, teachers, families, and staff wholeheartedly believe that it's time to bring our students home and offer them engaging, relevant, and community-based programming as a continuation of their E-12 career here in Minnetonka. It is an opportune time to set ourselves apart, as Minnetonka does in all areas, and build an outstanding transition program that aligns with the mission of the Minnetonka schools. With that, I will turn it over to Paul Bourgeois to discuss the financial benefit to this proposal. Do you want to maybe Paul? take questions? Oh. Um, Andy, um, can we um, uh, pull the grid view back up and pause for a moment? While Ms. Breen is up here, um, let, uh, I would like to give an opportunity for board members to ask any questions. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, John. Yeah, great. So thank you. Uh, great overview. I really appreciate always the insight about things we're doing for our vulnerable populations. And so and you think about the launch date with this program, when it's going to be available for young adults to start using it. And those people that are already in that program um, within the, the St. Louis Park area, how do we think about managing that transition? Because we've heard, I've heard comments that people are really excited about Minnetonka to really build up this space and, and take our level of excellence to service these young adults. And I've also heard concerns about people being disruptive, say, in their last year of the program. And so just want to get your thoughts on how we help make sure we get the right transition plan for the right families. Great question, John. Um, so one of the next steps for us, um, pending board approval here tonight, is to formulate a task force of current parents and parents in our high school, as well as parents in our middle schools who haven't yet experienced this opportunity. We will also have administrators from the high school, um, myself and Kristen Laughlin, my team, um, really hearing from parents about what is working in the current program, what they would like to see continue in our new program, um, and then ensure that we have adequate time for all of the construction, all of the time, um, and then time to tour our families, time to bring our families in at the completion of construction. We're also wanting our current staff members to be extremely hands-on and, and participate with us in the design. They know what um, their students need on a daily basis, and so we're really gonna work to involve parents, community members, school administrators in the planning um, to ensure that we don't lose the amazing things that are happening at the current Transition Plus program, but also um, assure them that um, we have great plans for a future um, home here in Minnetonka. That, that's awesome. We just, heard, we just heard so many things that are working from the various uh, families that are, have kids in those programs, and they're all kind of different. So I think that that ability to get that parent feedback about the different aspects of the current program that's working, so we can bring those design attributes into the Minnetonka programs and be super important. So thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Christine. Yeah, this is really exciting. Um, along the lines of the design, um, the building itself, I was looking at the plans and some of the feedback we got from some of the parents is the need for these students to have more space than is, is normally required for, for a regular student who's in a traditional classroom. Does this facility allow us to have adequate space for exercise and stimulation for those kids? Absolutely, and I can answer a little bit about it um, and Paul can maybe jump in as well. When we initially started to look at this space, um, Paul kept talking about 8,100 square feet, 8,100 square feet. And to me, um, I, that, I didn't have a frame of reference, Christine, so great question. Um, and what we did next was we walked through it. Dr. Peterson, myself, Paul, Kristen Laughlin, um, and our ATS and our designers walked through the space. And so it really took um, walking right in there. There is so much space there. Currently, there's a very large space that is um, wide open that they use for physical therapy. And so if we needed to do um, adaptive physical education, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, large motor movements, there's already a very large space um, present. Then there are very, um, a lot, like Dr. Peterson said, of individual spaces that we look to create, um, as I called them, labs. Learning labs of um, a greenhouse, um, all of those that were on the slide previously. And so students will have individual spaces to work on their own unique and individual skills. Um, and then there will be um, spaces for collaboration, eating together, cooking together, that community um, within our own program. And so 
Um, long story, or long answer to your question, but yes, there is ample space, um, I believe, strongly to meet all the needs of the students in that program. Great, thank you. Um, to follow up quickly on that, um, I, I have an idea of where the space is and I know it's off of Highway 7, but is there the ability for outdoor space to be incorporated? Yeah, one of the really exciting spaces um, is right behind the building is a little pond and there's a picnic table um, and just kind of a little kind of um, small kind of rec area that kids could go for a walk, sit and eat a picnic lunch, um, just go outside for a quick walk break. Um, it's really safe because there's parking lots around. It's not right off um, that frontage road where it's very busy. So um, yes, there is a small little space um, off to the back that has a pond and a, and a picnic table for our students. Perfect, sounds great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Christine. Mike. Yeah, I was just wondering, so I've, I've heard good things of, about the program as it currently is, and I do believe Minnetonka can take it to the next level. And, and I think the presentation is actually fantastic. Christine asked, asked the question I was wondering about the space because Initially, we are comparing it to traditional space in the students and, and, you know, you answered it well, you know, that question. But I was wondering as far as the enrollment, showed on all the pages, you know, the numbers have been declining and then they're, they're jumping up 50% next year to 33 and then it continues to go up. So um, similar to the success we've had in other programs, I, I am quite confident we'll have even more success with this program is um what's the max capacity and then how do we determine you know of those uh, participants how how do we how do we monitor that i mean are those first i guess the first question is why was it declining and it got to 22 uh, you know students this year what's the jump next year and, and what will be i think the cap is is 40 as i understand yeah um i can maybe paul can answer the the cap um uh, question. However, I can certainly respond, Mike, to the to the changes or fluctuations in students. Um, as we shared with our current Minnetonka staff at at T plus, uh, it is not for anyone's lack of trying. But um, you know, Minnetonka high school staff, I think, because the location is so far away, and it is a it is a um, you know program removed from our physical location. Um, we may not be referring enough students. We may not be catching our mildly disabled students who are not yet ready for college and could really utilize that additional year or two of supports in any area of those five transition areas before we launch them out of their home or into college. And so I think um, we've had a little bit, bit of a decline in students, um, but we really believe as we build our own and kind of reframe our staff's understanding of that definition of transition and who we might serve. We will broaden um, the, the group of students we can serve. Um, the staff will have um, kind of a better understanding of, of who to refer to that program. Um, so I do, I do continue to see um, those numbers um, as they're projected to continue to rise and stay in that high 30 range in the future. Thank you, makes sense. Um, thanks, Mike. Any other questions? Um, maybe we have, maybe ready for Paul to present a little bit. Yes, yes. Um, I, my question, and it could go to Paul, uh, was piggybacking a little bit on Mike, was uh, looking at the numbers and, and some of the projections, um, comparing the two facilities. So, you know, leaving the, the cooperative and taking the ownership of this, uh, um, is there, it's more of a max, is there um, more capacity for us to take um, to utilize the space for more students here than in T plus, is, is there a difference? So, are we running a risk at running out of space where you know where an existing space could? Is is what I had in my head a, a little bit? Well, the existing space is limited. Yes. So we're not able to expand that, and yep. we're subject to the choices that Hopkins and uh, St. Louis Park students make there too. Yeah, um, I don't have concerns with that. Sure. Um, I think, you know, uh, aspects of the program, there are students on site in a day. So while 40 may be the max in a building at one time, never will 40 all be in one, one space at one time. Some students are more significantly impaired that will stay on site the majority of their day, mm -hmm. a typical school day. Then we have our community-based students who may um, only come to that location an hour, mm -hmm. three days a week. 
Um, and so we can serve a significantly higher number of students with greater flexibility in that building here in our community. Um, it reduces transportation to and from, midday routes to and from. Um, so while the, the overall capacity might be 40, they'll never all be there at the same time. Um, and it gives us flexibility to serve students who may otherwise not have chosen to attend um, our off-site location. I think that's, that, that's really the crux of my question is that we're gonna be able to serve more students potentially um, th than less because of the proximity, because of the space. Um, you know, and that's a that's a huge uh, benefit, I, I, I would say. And um, we had heard, uh, to Mike's other point, um, to we've had some community members talk about um, some of the community partnerships that T Plus currently has. And um, I think you, you, you've presented um, a, a lot of great options. And I would, I would. Um, uh, uh, point the community back to just look at even the momentum program in the last uh, as well as the Vantage program we know how to do community partnerships and and really getting our students uh, combined or, or connected to local businesses to local opportunities I think is very very huge and, and bringing that home I think is a huge benefit for it so before Paul goes on so thank you um, yeah. ready for Paul yes uh, so Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Bourgeois uh, go over more of the details on the <clears throat> facility itself, <clears throat> excuse me, and the uh, price that we've negotiated with the owner. Uh, we've completed that uh, work, so the board knows what the uh, cost would be for the building itself, and we've got an estimate from ATSNR on the remodeling. And uh, you have a picture of the building from I guess three different angles maybe. Uh, doesn't show the back part there as much as uh, we might wanna see later. But uh, Mr. Bourgeois, would you go ahead and talk about uh, some of those details so the board can decide whether they wanna purchase this property? Paul, we can't hear you if, um, and I can't see you, so I don't know if you're trying to talk. Andy, can you guys hear Paul? We cannot. I just saw in the comments, he said he's gonna have to sign back in. Just oh, perfect. Thank you. We couldn't, I couldn't see the, the grid view, so thank you, Mike. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you, Paul. Okay. I, I was listening for the whole board meeting. Sometimes it's like the thing goes to sleep or something and everything locks up. So I just had to reboot, or not reboot, but I'd log out and log back in. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Uh, regarding the uh, uh, the uh, Shorewood Professional Building, it came open in, in September. I happened to notice it on the, because uh, I, I look for those types of things when I'm driving around the district. Um, and a couple weeks later, um, commercial uh, broker Mark Evenson actually sent me some information on it saying, hey, just as FYI, this is available in your area. At the time, I said, I, thanks. Uh, we don't have anything in particular. I noticed it, but, uh, you know, let's keep it in mind. Uh, and then um, in December, Christine came and said to me and said, hey, we are looking for something to do with possibly maybe doing um, our own um, transition to adult program. And I mentioned her, I said, well, this might be a good building. Let's go take a look at it. Uh, the facility is 8,150 square feet. And uh, for a comparison, if you've been in one of the new gyms that we built at Scenic Heights or Clear Springs or Groveland, those buildings are, those gyms are 6,600 square feet. So in terms of the square footage, this building is almost, is about 20% larger than one of those gymnasiums. So there's an, a lot of space. When you, 
it's been it's been designed to be a, a medical clinic so there's a lot of small walls and little cubby areas because they have examination rooms but all those walls are knocked down walls uh they really uh can you know are, are made to be reconfigured and so uh what we're going to be doing is looking at and working with christine uh and her staff about the, with the program uh and what are the program needs exactly and we'll go in and we'll do something very similar to what we did when we actually took over the Vantage Suite. We left a lot of walls in place, but we moved some out and, and adjusted things around to make sure that spaces were the right fit for the needs of the program. Uh, ATSNR has estimated that this will be approximately $500,000 in conversion costs. So uh, the, the building was listed at $1.9 million. Uh, we've uh, negotiated a purchase price um, uh, we're not we're not locked in uh, um, any approval of the board we've negotiated a purchase price of one million seven hundred thousand um, dollars and so we would be funding this with about a 2.2 million dollar uh, bond the advantage of doing it of, of doing a bond and owning the building is that we don't have to pay property taxes uh every year uh we don't have to pay other other leasehold expenses that might go along with it and uh um we have complete control of the building. We also lock in a flat payment. Typically, if you lease a building, the rents go up every every year. And, uh, uh, you know, so you have an increase in cost. But basically, by owning the building, we basically have a flat, we would have a flat payment of approximately $138,000 per year. And, um, uh, and then after 20 years, that would go away. We did an analysis of a comparison of our staff, uh, our, well, so assuming the staff costs are going to be, be the same based on, you know, try to get an apples to apples comparisons. Teachers and the paraprofessionals required to run the program are going to pretty much be the same based on the number of students, assuming an equal number of students. Of course, if you have more students going there, that would change. But then in terms of the operational costs, there's some significant savings uh, in terms of lease payments, our lease payments are have, have escalated over the years with Transitions Plus, just like any other uh, lease payment, um, you know, which is which is a rent, uh, so it's not fixed. The other thing is is the location of the uh, current Transitions Plus building is a, it's a long drive, it's a long ride on a bus, and we actually have to employ five buses in the morning for about two thirds of of, a, of the of the three tiers of our route, uh, and four in the afternoon. Uh, if we are able to move to this particular facility, we will save uh, a significant amount of dollars because we'll be down to two routes in the morning using one tier, about one, one third of a, of a morning route, and two in the afternoon. Uh, so there's some significant advantages. Uh, cost analysis I, that we put together that we shared with you were uh, over the first, um, over the, the initial 20 years, I did 20 years because that's how long the, the bond payment would be. Um, we would basically be uh, saving about 51% of those operational costs. And then once the bond drops off and we don't have that payment anymore, basically we're saving about 62% of those operational costs. So uh, the money is, is actually um, going to accrue to, to savings in the general fund. The other advantage also is that with this operating capital, um, uh, we, we'd use operating capital to make the payment rather than right now, the, the payment is in the general fund um, uh, for, for the leases for the uh, transition for the T plus program. And it's coded to special education, although for special education, we don't get reimbursement for that. That's not allowed. I, I verified that with Paul Farron, who's the uh, special education expert at the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, they We get reimbursed for operational costs. So any type of lease or rent is actually paid for out of the cross subsidy from the general fund. Well, that would basically go away and we'd be able to code this payment on the bond to, to operating capital. And we're going to be looking at actually uh, refunding the 2013E uh, certificates of participation simultaneous with this. They're coming up for uh, for refunding and restructuring. And we're going to drop the, drop those payments and layer this other payment right in with it. And so what will happen is the general fund will actually benefit by another 138000 and that's not even uh, taken into account in terms of the overall funding and uh, savings analysis that I had done. So there's some compelling financial reasons to do it. Um, the 8,100 8, square feet for 40 students is, is a little over 200 square feet per student. 
if you look, take our, our 11,100 K-12 students and divide it by uh, 1.8 million square feet, we're at about 160 square feet per student. There's a significant amount of space available. So uh, we don't think that we will be challenged for space in this particular facility. Uh, there's 30 parking spots. Uh, there is also an easement um, through the Alaris Bank parking lot that our small buses would be able to loop through and drop off and then, and then leave out the driveway. So um, it's uh, it, there's some, some advantages to it, uh, it to meet the program needs of the students. And the other advantage is also much shorter bus rides for the students. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's a good, t for, depending on what part of the district you're coming from, it, it's, a, it's a 20 mile ride in city traffic. So it can be a 30 to 40 to 45 minute bus ride uh, or, or longer both ways um, with a, you know, with, with a facility basically right in the center of the district. The bus rides for the students are going to be much shorter and there's going to be much better access for the parents of, of those children also. Although I guess they're technically they're adults. So um, they're, you know, but their parents uh, and, and guardians will have much better access to be able to be available and, and maybe be part of the whole process in, in the program. So. Uh, that's the summary from a, a financial and, and logistical standpoint uh, in terms of what's being proposed. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Andy, can we see the um, grid view? Uh, do board members want to ask questions or should we move to a motion? Yes, Mike. That was interesting. My brother, um, I saw that uh, there's a, the Duns Brothers was mentioned in Hopkins. My brother actually owns the Duns Brothers, so I, I asked him because I, I have not been that familiar with the Transition Plus uh, program. And he just, he raved about, you know, since 2005, they've been involved with them. And, and the kids through that program have been phenomenal, you know, as well as the manager, you know, and, and that uh, works with them and, and, and places the kids in the program. And so, um, you know, and I, I looked at this uh, you know, proposal and I, I thought, I have full confidence we can take it to the next level yeah, at Manitonka. And as I went through it, I, I frankly can't think of any, we wouldn't want to do it for all those reasons financially that you outlined, Paul. And that as Christine said, you know, for all the different benefits for those students in that space, um, you know, in our district. So um, yeah, excellent presentation. and. and Franklin, full support. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else? Yes, Lisa. Um, you know, I, th I think that um, just to piggyback on what Mike said, um, and thanks, Paul, for the financials, because it's always you know good to make sure that we're making good decisions with our taxpayers' money as we're we're looking at these things. But you know, I mean, I, I really appreciate the wonderful partnership that we've had in the past with. Um, St. Louis Park and Hopkins on this program, um, and I, I think that you know, as a as a board and as a district, we've talked for such a long time about being E12 and lifelong learners, and now this gives us the opportunity to truly be, you know, in in E through age 21 district for our, our students locally, um, which is you know, so great to have them in our community. It's a great opportunity for the community to get involved and interact with them and understand the program and participate in it. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about this opportunity, um, you know, both from the financial standpoint, but also for the just engagement with the community, I think is, is tremendous. It, you know, I don't really see it as anything in any way, shape or form of being negative about the T plus program, because I think that we've had such a fabulous long term partnership with that group. I just really see it as a as a a great um, lifelong learning e, e through 21 year old opportunity for us, which is so in keeping with our vision that we've talked about for our students. So, um, I guess having said that, I would make a motion that we move forward and um, approve this. Okay, thank you, Lisa. There is a motion on the table um, to approve the purchase of the Shorewood Professional Building located at 19695 Highway 7 in Shorewood, Minnesota for $1.7 million and authorize administration to execute all closing documents for the acquisition of the Shorewood Professional Building. Do we have a second? Katie. Katie. Any comments or questions? 
Um, Paul, I have j just w one question. Um, uh, uh, it may not just be one, but um, when we look at this, uh, obviously acquiring a property, um, the, the maintenance and the long-term maintenance uh, does come into consideration. Obviously, without having the property um, and, and having that, is there any concerns? Does that fall, do that just move right into our 10-year long-term maintenance program uh, with our um, facilities bonding program to be able to do that? I, I mean, is that really the, the, the mechanism and the funding? Uh, to, to handle that? Um, yes, Mr. Chair. It, and in fact, uh, just as a comparison, we've uh, we leased the bus garage, and so we're responsible with the triple net lease to make all the repairs and fixes on it. And so that money has to come out of the general fund because when we have to do something there, because uh, it's not owned by us, and so we can't uh, use long-term facility maintenance for it. This facility will be owned by us, and so uh, it, it just apparently has a new roof that was put on, but we will be doing an, a due diligence inspection of it, by the way. Um, but it's in very good condition. Park Nicollet kept it in good shape internally. Uh, it's 23 years old, uh, but it'll be part of the long-term facility maintenance uh, you know, program as a, as a district-owned building. Good. Thank, thank you, Paul. Uh, Christine. Yes, I did have a question. I think this is a fantastic idea and I love having the kids closer. Our, our neighbor is Transition Plus and that bus comes really early. So I'm sure that having them closer would be welcome to all the families and students involved. Um, so I have full faith this will work out, but I did want to ask a question. If we were ever to have to repurpose this building, is there any limitation beyond that or with the bonds that we're having that we're issuing or how we're categorizing and financing this? Um, actually, that's a good question, uh, the, but the the answer is is no. The, the The building itself is the collateral for the bonds. How we actually use it is is completely up to us. So, if for some reason this program dwindled or got too big and needed to go somewhere else, we could repurpose this to any other need. Uh, and then at at, at at well as in at any point in time, actually after the call date, if for some reason we didn't need it, uh, you could actually sell the building and pay off the remaining bonds and 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 you know, walk away from it too, if that was the choice. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously we're hoping that the program will continue on and be a, a rousing success. Uh, but there is the ability to, uh, you know, sell the building after the call date of the bonds, um, you know, if that was the, the decision that had to be made at that time. Perfect, thank you. I, I have full faith it'll work out too. I'm just a risk manager at heart, so I had to ask mm -hmm. the question. Yeah. Th thank you, Christine. Any other questions or comments? Katie. Christine or Mr. Bourgeois, I'm not quite sure. Um, it, it does. It's a great proposal. I, I but what my question is, and is because I'm unfamiliar with the enrollment process of the Transition Plus in bringing this program in house. Um, is this a program that is limited to our residents, or is it one that um, open enroll lees could come and um, use the facility? I, I, I'm just not familiar with the program as it's not been, you know, we've, we've been going elsewhere. Yeah, thanks for that um, question, Katie. At this time, um, it will be Minnetonka High School students um, to begin the year next year. Um, that said, Dr. Peterson and I have had conversations about potentially um, having other districts open enroll their students into our program. I would envision, um, as Dr. Peterson and I were talking through this, and um, when I think about momentum, going and visiting um, really robust existing um, programs, that doesn't exist um, for us to go and really seek out um, a state-of-the-art transition program. And as Dr. Peterson um, stated, that will be ours. We are very much looking forward to having a state-of-the-art um, sought-after program that other um, districts and families may want to choose to open and enroll their students into. So we certainly um, are open to that and we'll be kind of watching our enrollment numbers and, and monitoring potential open enrollment in the future as well. Thanks, I, I, I wasn't familiar. It, great presentation, so you su summarized it pretty, you know, really well with um, the, the partnership that we've had um, in the past and really value that, but it will be wonderful to see our, our students come um, back to our own community and building those partnerships within our community. And as always, love to hear the cost savings. Um, so that's great, thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, we can move to a, vo a roll call vote. Board members, when I call your name, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosian? Aye. Board member Bourgeois? Aye. Board member Peterson? Aye. Board member Bourgeois? 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 Aye. Board member Bour
Aye. Board Member Becker? Aye. Aye. Board Member Holcomb? Aye. Aye. Board Member Lesage? Aye. Aye. Board Member Ritchie? Aye. Aye. Board Member Vitale? Aye. Board Member Wagner? Aye. Aye. Thank you. That is seven ayes. The motion carries. Thank you, board members. Looking forward to it. Um, our next item is the approval of sale of 2021A taxable um, general obligation OPEB refunding bonds. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Oh, sorry, please note that this is a carry in item. Um, you probably would have said that, Dr. Peterson, uh, but you guys should have received that uh, this morning, I believe, um, via email. Yep. Sorry, Dr. Peterson. Yeah. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I was also going to mention that it's a carry-in. We have the results of the bond sale, and uh, it's really a, a great story uh, here. We probably don't want to take all the time it takes to tell it, but uh, the interest in Minnetonka bonds is just unbelievable, and uh, we had many-fold uh, the uh, interest in uh, bonds from Minnetonka than we were able to sell. So uh, this is the... Uh, uh, refunding bonds of the OPEB uh, bonds that we started out as uh, taxable bonds. And uh, Mr. Bourgeois is going to go over the details of this sale and uh, the great rate that we were able to get for taxpayers and how much money we're going to be able to save on uh, this refunding. So, Mr. Bourgeois, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, on uh, Tuesday the 5th, we were one of the first school districts out of the, the gate, actually the first public entities out of the gate in 2021, uh, working to refund these bonds. And we targeted that day because there's typically not a lot of, uh, of volume on the market. So we ended up with $140 million worth of offers for our $19,855,000 of bonds that we were selling to refund our OPEB bonds. Uh, so there was a really great competition for it. We. Um, had originally estimated uh, savings, net present value savings of a little over $411,000 and uh, taking our rate from 3.09% down to 1.99% when we asked you for authorization to refund these bonds. And the actual results came in at uh, net present value savings of 973,000 uh, and uh, interest rate of 1.64% for these 20 year bonds. So uh, this is actually the, la the last step in uh, the original bonds were issued way back in 2008, 2009, uh, when we had a window of opportunity to issue bonds to fund our, our other post-employment benefits uh, liability. And uh, at that time, we issued them at 6.83%, which was a, a rate that was a good rate then because of the financial situation. In 2013, we refunded that down to 3.09%, and now we've refunded it down to 1.64%. So. Um, and actually, um, the 2013 bond issue was a $2.2 million save net present value savings. So uh, we've been able to get net present value savings over the two refundings over the years of, of, of a little over $3 million. Um, these, this also then smooths out the payments and locks them in uh, to the end of maturity. Although we do have one more call date that we have to uh, give us the opportunity to do a refunding out to the current maturities. Uh, or the, the current maturity end date, uh, again, if the uh, situation warrants it and the odds are in our favor. Um, that sounds like the Hunger Game. Um, if the uh, odds, if the, uh, or not the odds, but the, the markets are in our favor um, to, uh, you know, to refund once more, get, get additional savings. So I guess with that, I'd ask you to approve the bond sale of <laughs> uh, at 1.64%. Thank, thank you, Paul. Um, can I get a motion to approve the 2021A taxable general obligation OPEB uh, refunding bob, uh, bonds sale resolution as prepared by Dorsey and Whitney? Uh, uh, Lisa, uh, second is Mark. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, we can move to a roll call vote. Okay. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. aye. Board member Becker? Aye. aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. 
Aye. Board Member Vitale. Aye. Board Member Wagner. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, that is seven ayes. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Our next agenda item is another carry-in uh, action uh, and is the acceptance of bids for replacement of retaining walls at Einer Anderson Stadium. Dr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, this is work that the uh, board has authorized us to uh, move forward with and get bids. And we opened those bids, uh, I think today, and uh, the uh, bids you can see in front of you, but Mr. Bourgeois is gonna go over the uh, details of how um, they came in and uh, the successful bidder. So Mr. Bourgeois, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pearson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, we opened bids this afternoon to replace the retaining walls at Einer Anderson. Uh, for those of you who've been down in that area, you can see they're starting to kind of crumble away a little bit. And uh, you know, so the, the, uh, the smaller blocks and are a different type of structure that tend to not handle salt and, and that type of thing well from having to salt the driveways and things of that nature. Plus, they're just de uh, degrading over time. So um, we have a, a project in long-term maintenance for this coming summer to replace the walls all the way down the driveway, both sides of the driveway, and then up and around to the um, to the uh, stands uh, and uh, the low bid on that is $539,500. Uh, Ross Action is a firm that our engineers have uh, had as low bidders on other projects and they apparently are more than capable of doing a good job according to Inspec Engineering. Um, the um, We're going to be replacing them with what we call big block retaining wall blocks. Uh, you see those around the campus. We started using them uh, on the bus driveway, the new bus driveway. They have We have them there. Uh, and a couple of other places. So um, those are uh, um, going to be sturdy, much more uh, long-term solution uh, than than these particular blocks that are replacing. So, and uh, it's it's not it's not inexpensive, but as a comparison, when we had to replace retaining walls at Veterans Field, that four hundred twenty-five thousand dollar project for probably not as big a space. So it's, it's pretty much in line. We just ask that you to prove it so that, that we can get that uh, area fixed up and repaired and looking. Um, for thank you. Great. Um, can I get a motion to accept uh, the low bid of Rosti uh, Construction in the amount of five hundred thirty-nine thousand five hundred dollars for replacement of the retaining walls at Einer and Anderson Stadium in summer of two twenty twenty-one? Uh, John, and a second is uh, Mike. Thank you. Um, we can move. To, uh, any comments or questions? Uh, great. Uh, we can move to a roll call vote. Okay. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosen. Aye. Board member Becker. Aye. Aye. Board member Holcomb. Aye. Aye. Board member Lesage. Aye. Aye. Board member Ritchie. Aye. Aye. Board member Vitali. Aye. Board member Wagner. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. That is seven ayes, uh, and the motion carries. Can oh, I get thank a, you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Uh, Katie, a second. Mike, um, any comments or questions? Uh, seeing none, uh, let's move to a roll call vote. Sorry. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Aye. Board member Vitale? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Thank you. Uh, that Thank is you seven board. ayes. A motion carries. Uh, thank you. Um, now it's time uh, in the agenda for board reports. Does anybody have on the board have anything to report? Okay, um, superintendent's report, Dr. Peterson. Yeah, I don't have much to report. We've kind of done it throughout the meeting. <laughs> but uh, I would uh, remind the board that uh, the legislature is in session and uh, beginning to uh, take up different measures. Obviously, uh, handling the COVID uh, situation for them has been challenging. And uh, so it's harder for public access also to uh, 
watch them in action and so forth. But uh, we will continue to work with them. I've met uh, personally with some uh, legislators since the breakfast we had. Uh, also, Congress and uh, has passed and the president signed the bill that gave uh, schools some additional federal funds. We don't know exactly how much we'll get yet, but we'll sort that out as quickly as we can. So I um, would remind uh, board members that uh, if they want to sit in on the AMSD meeting tomorrow, they might get some more details from, on legislation. Great. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, uh, next agenda item is announcements. Does anybody have any, any announcements? Seeing none, um, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? Uh, Mike, a second. John? Um, any comments? I don't know. Do we take comments or questions? I don't think so. <laughs> um, oh, we have to do roll call. Yes. Uh, we move to a roll call vote. I didn't know this one. Board members, if in favor, please say aye. Oppose, nay. Board member Ambrosen? Aye. Board member Becker? Aye. Board member Holcomb? Aye. Board member Lesage? Aye. Aye. Board member Ritchie? Aye. Aye. Board member Vitali? Aye. Board member Wagner? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>